Have you heard about the Flatwoods Monster? What about the Whirling Wimpus? Do you know what the hell a, a devil dog is? How about a sheep squatch? Get ready to meet all these strange critters and more today. These might sound like elaborate fantasy creations in some giant Dungeons and Dragons Forgotten Realms campaign or creatures from the Lord of the Rings, maybe the Game of Thrones universe. Nope, they're from our world, kind of, maybe. They're cryptids. They're animals such as Sasquatch or the Loch Ness Monster that have been claimed to exist but never conclusively proven to exist. Despite a lack of hard scientific evidence, many believe that the creatures I just named are all too real. Some people believe they've had actual encounters with them and with Pennsylvania's White Bigfoot, the so-called Tennessee Wild Man, and many others. Some also believe in non-creature mysteries like the mysterious lights over Brown Mountain in North Carolina, saying there's no possible way they can be scientifically explained. I talked about these lights in the sister show to Time Suck, Scared to Death. Technically, these lights are uh, not thought to be cryptids. They're not creatures, but could those lights be attributed to cryptids, perhaps? Maybe they're, maybe they're cryptid adjacent. So we'll include them today as well. What do all these strange creatures and phenomena have in common? All supposed encounters with them and folklore about them has come from Appalachia. And yes, that is how I'm going to pronounce it today for the most part. I know on last week's preview for this episode, I said I prefer Appalachian, and I still do prefer that pronunciation, actually, but since I'm from the North and not from Appalachia, it feels after completing this week's research more appropriate for me to say Appalachia. I'll thoroughly break down my reasoning today regarding the history of this word whose correct pronunciation has been hotly debated by many for a long time. Uh, Then after all that, I'll possibly end up pronouncing it both ways throughout the episode. The mysterious allure of the Appalachian cryptids has existed for centuries for the Europeans who settled the land and existed for longer, perhaps much longer, for the indigenous people who lived in the lands of Appalachia for thousands of years prior to the arrival of foreign colonists. And these people believe that Appalachia, a region on the eastern side of the U.S. that stretches from New York to Georgia, is positively teeming with cryptids. We've actually visited an infamous Appalachian cryptid before, Mothman, arguably the king of Appalachian cryptids. But there are so many more weird and wild creatures allegedly roaming the hills, mountains of Appalachia. There are so many that there's even been a popular long-running TV show called Mountain Monsters, now on the Travel Channel, that investigates, quote-unquote, these Appalachian cryptids on the show. John Trapper Tice, Jeff Headley, Willie McQuillan construct elaborate traps to try and catch these creatures. And allegedly they have caught some, if you believe that a bunch of CGI effects and prop and costume designs constitute catching encrypted, which I do not. Sorry for the shade, mountain monster people, but come on. 69 episodes and counting and still no truly undeniable evidence. Can't catch one long enough to bring it to the lab for a proper examination. Still no cryptid alive or dead for a team of scientists to examine as opposed to a team of travel channel actors wearing lab coats and holding clipboards and calling themselves scientists. Look harder, mountain monster team. The enduring popularity of a program like this showcases just how many people believe that cryptids might actually live in the woods of Appalachia, a land that outside of possible monsters is for sure an interesting cultural melting pot of Scotch-Irish, German, Scandinavian, tribal, and African-American influences, but mostly Scotch-Irish. Talk about that. Appalachia, uh, home to a lot of different folks, a lot of interesting folklore, a lot of good stories, and we love interesting stories here. So let's explore some Appalachian imaginations or real encounters, depending on how you see it. This week on a chock full of cryptids, bluegrass jamboree, real or merely legend, wackadoodle or witness edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday and happy holidays, Meat Sacks. Ha- happy holidays. Uh, happy Hanukkah. Merry Christmas. Merry Xmas. Uh, Merry happy joy joy. Uh, you know, to whatever you happen to be celebrating. Hope you enjoy your pine trees, uh, scented candles, uh, Jesus birthday cake, Santa cookies, leather chaps, uh, straight vodka. However you're celebrating, whatever you're celebrating. Uh, thanks for including the cult of the curious in your holiday plants. Hail Nimrod, hope everyone sacrificed enough Cocker Spaniels to keep you, uh, you know, from smiting them on Christmas morn or something. Hail Lucifina, I picture you in a sexy Santa outfit, complete with garters and a lot of red, you know, see-through stuff. Uh, praise Bojangles and glory be to Triple M, Michael motherfucking McDonald, of course, has a holiday album called In the Spirit because he is God's one true angel. Uh-huh. Doesn't fill your heart with joy? Well, congratulations, you're fucking dead. 
okay. It's, it's, it's bluesier than, you know, most would expect. <laughs> That's what an artist does. You know, they put their own stamp on it. Mm-hmm. We won't be playing this forever, but you got to hear this next part. Mm-hmm. And now he goes. Oh! What's he saying? Only he knows. Fucking scatting! Yes, he can scat! Of course he can. That's a, a akin to the air banjo level of talent. Uh, I know today's topic is not holiday related, but it's the uh, one our space leaders chose. So it's obviously the right call. A couple quick announcements, and then we'll get to this weird show. Uh, hearts go out to those affected by recent tornadoes in Kentucky and elsewhere in the uh, Midwest. Mother Nature, God, she can be a real bitch sometimes. Uh, terrible to happen anytime. Obviously, it feels extra terrible with the timing now. Uh, some good news. Uh, charity for the third straight December, the Bad Magic Giving Tree, has uh, brought many joy. Proud to say that together we ended up raising $49,000 thanks to uh, $16,000 from the Bad Magic Patreon supporters, another $15,000 from Lindsay Nye's savings account, and my favorite number, another $18,000 uh, at the end of the day coming in from Bad Magician savings accounts. So we really do have a uh, such a lovely community of fine sacks of meat, 198 kids, now going to have an epic holiday thanks to uh, this community. So thank you, thank you, thank you. A uh, quick note about the 2022 Symphony of Insanity stand-up tour. Uh, the February date I had in Austin, Texas is being moved to the fall because I, I fucking hate Austin, all right? I've been wanting to say it for years. I don't like anybody there. I've always hated that city. Uh, no, this is not my fault. Uh, the club will not be opening in time. I was very excited to go, but uh, 2022 going into now uh, uh, COVID uh, supply chain problems. But I guess the problems are now, so the 2021 problems. Yeah, they're having delays in, uh, you know, getting specialty restaurant equipment, special freezers and all their, I don't know, fucking burners. I don't know all the terms, but I know that that shit's not coming in on time. Uh, so new replacement date uh, uh, that weekend, Funny Bone in, in Richmond, Virginia, replacing Austin February 4th and 5th. And I'll, you know, get the new Austin date. We're locking it in for the fall. Other dates still on. San Diego, technically La Jolla, at the Comedy Store, Hollywood Comedy Store, Orlando Improv, Bricktown in Oklahoma City, Punchline in Atlanta, Comedy Zone in Charlotte, the Tempe Improv, the Wilma in Missoula, and more at dancummins.tv. Wise Guys in Salt Lake City. A lot of different dates. Uh, you can also follow me on uh, Instagram and Facebook for show announcements. And now let's, let's fucking get into it. Now for our Space Lizard voted in topic. Uh, actually, many, many topics. Because of just how many cryptids there are allegedly roaming the mountains of Appalachia. Let's put some yip in the yaw. Hog folk, dog folk, please set your differences aside and focus today. Let's all explore the mysteries of Appalachia together. Appalachian cryptids, the Virginia moonshine man possum, the green briar skink skank, the tittle whisper dragon of Johnson City, the rocky branch giant rape beetle. These are not the cryptids we're going to be talking about today because I made those ones up. Thank God the rocky branch giant rape beetle is not a thing anyone has to worry about. What a terrible cryptid, super horny one, maybe tries to bugger you out on some trail. I picture running into some backwoods hillbilly at the trailhead, warning you not to proceed. No, 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 no. He's fucked up. Won't be walking up this air trail. Not this time of season. Oh, not when the rocket band, rocket branch being in the rut. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, what? What are you, uh, what are you talking about? Rocket branch down right, baby. Clean your sound. You ain't seen pain. You ain't seen fear. Tell the rocket branch, hold you down, bugging in the dirt. Ain't no clan strong enough to keep rocket branch out of your trash pipe. Then you hear some loud insect noises in the distance. Fucking wild-eyed dude just starts running off. G get down in your motor carriage. Lock your side windows. Rocket branch going to plug your trash pipe. So fierce. Beat a man, fill you inside with fire. Uh, even though I just imagined that whole uh, fake scene, I'm kind of scared of that fucking guy. I might be more scared of that guy. The name of the, uh, you know, Rocky Branch giant rape beetle. How big is that thing, by the way? How, how big is its fearsome appendage? Why does it seem to go for loopholes? Those questions will probably never be answered. But I hope to answer others today. Uh, first, I'll be talking about uh, what Appalachia is, starting with the controversy, of course, over how to actually pronounce Appalachia. Uh, we'll also look at its history, its geography, music, and a uh, unique mix of cultures that have come together to create what we uh, now know as Appalachia. And we'll uh, dig into some of the stereotypes or, uh, surrounding Appalachia, look at uh, why it's overwhelmingly portrayed in the media as a backward, superstitious place uh, full of hillbillies. 
I mean, I just added to that stereotype with my crazy hillbilly uh, beetle warner. Why do I assume that that kind of guy would live somewhere out in Appalachia? We'll look into that. Uh, next, we'll get into the many, many cryptids in a big old time suck timeline. Cryptids of Appalachia. Then after the timeline, we'll examine a few more cryptids. Uh, just a pair of uh, them whose sightings we don't really have dates for. Uh, along the way, we also might, might run into rogue archaeologist, former University of Montana student, go Grist. Unofficial, official, self-proclaimed time suck resident cryptozoologist, David Hatcher Childress, the star of History Channel's Ancient Aliens, may not have time to stop by, though. He's undoubtedly hard at work on his 25th book. Not kidding. Uh, he released his 24th book, Hanabu, The Secret Files, the greatest UFO secret of all time, early this year. So that's epic. Other awesome titles include Yeti, Sasquatch, and Harry Giants, Lost Cities of Ancient Lemuria, and the Pacific. <laughs> I like how he added the Pacific to that one. Like, like he's like, nah, Lost Cities of uh, Ancient Lemuria doesn't feel like there's enough uh, fodder there for a proper book. What if I had the Pacific? Uh, the Enigma of Cranial Deformation, Elongated Skulls of the Ancients. David's a busy guy. Before all that, uh, we'll quickly revisit uh, Appalachia's most famous cryptid, the one we actually have already done a full suck on already, Mothman. Let's get, let's get warmed up with Mothman. First recorded Mothman sighting took place November 12th, 1966, near Clendenin, West Virginia, the now sleepy little town of just over 1,000 that used to be a slightly less sleepy little town, little oil town, about the same number of people. 76-mile drive southeast of Point Pleasant, uh, where most of the Mothman lore after the first sighting would concentrate. Point Pleasant, a bustling village of over 4,000, used to bustle with over 6,000. Very cute little downtown. That includes a cool-ass Mothman statue and a Mothman museum. And how did all the Mothman lore begin? Back on November 12, 1966, a Saturday, five men, Kenneth Duncan, Bob Lovejoy, Bill Poole, Andrew Godby, and Emil Gibson, were digging a grave for Ken's father-in-law, Homer Smith, in a cemetery near Clendenin. And Kenneth claimed to see a man-like figure fly out from some nearby trees and glide low over their heads. And he wasn't even high on bath salts or anything. Uh, didn't even have an important blood vessel popping his head. Ken's sighting would be referenced uh, in the November 18th, 1966 edition of the Gallipolis Daily Tribune, though it would mention that the four other men helping to dig the grave didn't see it, which, you know, is suspicious a bit. Uh, three days later, though, November 15th, 1966, multiple people would see it. There was another Mothman sighting in Point Pleasant really set off the Mothman craze. Four young, supposedly mentally stable locals, all around the age of 20. Roger and Linda Scarberry. Steve and Mary Mallett. They were driving uh, near Point Pleasant around midnight, and Roger's black 57 Chevy Bel Air, fuck yeah, uh, claimed to have been followed by this creature. Linda noticed two large glowing red eyes in the darkness behind the old North Power plant along Highway 62. Roger stopped the car on the road. Four locals observed a bipedal monster about seven feet tall, with wings folded against its back in the woods. They sped off, and the creature followed. Terrified, they reported the whole thing to local law enforcement. Then the local paper caught wind of the sighting, and the next day a story was printed about the monster in the Point Pleasant Register. How did all these little towns have papers? And the legend was off and running. And then many other sightings in West Virginia, and even some around the world, would follow. You can hear more about these sightings in episode 124 if you want to double down on your Appalachian cryptid intake today. So what is Mothman? The most popular theory outside of paranormal explanations is that Mothman is a sandhill crane or some other sort of strange bird, perhaps an owl. An owl greatly exaggerated in the minds of the people thinking that uh, they saw Mothman. That's true. If you see an owl and you think you've seen a fucking giant seven-foot-tall monster out in the woods, well, your eyes are worse than mine. I can't see for shit in the dark. Second explanation is that uh, Mothman is an alien of some kind or maybe a monster from uh, Native American folklore called the Thunderbird. Could also be a strange mutant, maybe an angel, maybe some kind of unidentified flying machine. Whatever it is, owl, crane, alien, mutant, angel, transformer, Polish supermodel. The lore around Mothman took off like it did uh, around no other cryptid in Appalachia. Point Pleasant held its first annual Mothman Festival in 2002, and pre-COVID, according to event organizer Jeff Wamsley, the average attendance for the Mothman Festival was uh, 10, 12,000 people a year. A lot more folks showing up for Mothman's festival than for the Rocky Branch Giant Rape Beetle Festival. Zero attendees ever in its history. So that's Mothman, a cryptid many have now claimed to have spotted, but also a famous cryptid no one has yet uh, been able to uh, take uh, even one good photo of. Mothman burning out of feeling words alone. 
And I think it's gonna be a long, long time For Mothman takes a photo we can find He's not a bird and he's not an owl Oh, no, no, no He's a Mothman If you're like, that's a good melody That's it's because it's Elton John's Rocket Man uh, What about other lesser known? Appalachian cryptids The indie band equivalent Only true hipsters know about them Cryptids The fucking deep cut crypt, The B-side cryptids like the Snallygaster, dragon-like creature who was reported in the Maryland area at the height of the Prohibition in the late 20s, early 30s. Also, uh, earlier, in a different form, the Sheep Squatch. <laughs> I love that name. We'll meet them uh, soon after we get a better feel for Appalachia. Seems to be a lot of confusion surrounding Appalachia. Hard for folks to come to an agreement on what Appalachia even is. Like, what are its geographical boundaries? Who are its people? How the fuck do you pronounce Appalachia? Let's address that. Let's address that hot button issue. It actually does get a lot of people uh, unusually fired up. I've read the emails. In a short essay published 30 years ago in Appalachian Heritage Magazine, now the Appalachian Review, has a circulation of seven people. One random Eastern Kentuckian wrote, What I finally came to understand is that Appalachia does not exist. At least it doesn't exist in the real world. The Appalachians exist. Appalachia exists. But Appalachia is fiction. It is an idea created by politicians and reporters. Interesting. <laughs> uh, if this person has uh, been listening to this episode, they probably had a brain aneurysm by now. Uh, let's dig into some linguistic history to find out if they're right. In addition to there being a debate over the pronunciation, there's a speculation over the true origin of the word. Speculation originates with uh, some people who used to live in the area of northern Florida, now not even considered a part of Appalachia. Uh, back in the 1500s, the Appalachian tribe a Muscogean people, indigenous to the panhandle of Florida, i.e. Northwest Florida. The Muscogean people were those tribe members who spoke related languages in the southeastern U.S., including Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, Seminole, and Appalachia, amongst others. Only about 300 people in the world now claim Appalachia identity. Almost all of them living in Louisiana now after various relocations. Disease, massacres, a lot of early fighting with the Spanish. So many raids decimated the Appalachia. Uh, then later, a lot of tribe members being captured and taken in as slaves by English settlers further reduced the population. By around 1700, less than two centuries after encountering the Spanish, less than a thousand remained. How many were there originally? No one knows for sure, but likely tens of thousands. Spanish conquistador, uh, Panfilio de Navares. That's probably the best I'll ever say that. Was one of the first Europeans to encounter these peoples. Embarked from Spain in 1527 with five ships and 600 men on a mission to colonize Florida for Holy Roman Emperor and King of Spain, Charles V. And in uh, 1528, his expedition, shortly before most of its members died in a combination of fighting and shipwrecks, including uh, Narayas, they reached a chieftain called Tocobaga at the northern end of Tampa Bay. Tocobaga was the name of the chieftain, uh, named the village, uh, named the Spaniards gave to the people living there. They were just like, fuck it, everyone here is Tocobaga. And these people told uh, Narvaez that there was a nation called Appalachian up north, home of the Appalachian people. And that's where this term comes from. But the exact word the Appalachian used to name the region, that's up for a little bit of debate. Uh, Appalachian perhaps derived from the Appalachian word uh, Appalachian, meaning other, other side of the river, or from the uh, Hitchity word Appalachian, meaning dwelling on one side. Uh, Hitchity, another Muscogian language, spoke by the Hitchity tribe a little further north in present-day Georgia. Uh, after barely reaching the Appalachia, the Narvaez expedition encountered heavier than expected fighting, fled to the coast, encountered bad storms. Almost all of them drowned off the coast of present day Texas. Only a few would uh, make it back to uh, Mexico City many years later. They have to fucking walk and it'll take them years. Not even kidding. It was the worst fucking expedition ever. Uh, 11 years later, the Hernando de Soto expedition, another Spanish conquistador, conquistador, ah, fucked it up, uh, reached the main Appalachian town of Anhaika. Somewhere in the area of present-day Tallahassee, Florida, probably near Lake uh, Mikasugi. Mikasuki. Uh, the site of that old town has been known as the Martin Archaeological Site since 1988. That year, Florida State University archaeologist B. Calvin Jones, Indiana Jones-ish, uncovered early 16th century Spanish coins, olive jars, chain mail, crossbow quarrels on the grounds of Governor John W. Martin House in Tallahassee. Uh, that site now considered to have the best claim to be the winter encampment of the DeSoto Expedition and part of the DeSoto Site Historic State Park. And back when DeSoto was alive and not just an important historical figure, he adapted the Native American name 
uh, Appalachia, applied it to the coastal region bordering Appalachia Bay, as well as to the tribe that lived uh, around there. Appalachia is still the name of the bay in uh, northeastern in the northeastern Gulf of Mexico, occupying an indentation of the Florida coast to the west to where the Florida Peninsula joins the U.S. mainland. And DeSoto and his uh, party cemented Appalachian as the term for the land that lay north of Florida. And over time, that term morphed into the name of the region of present-day Appalachia. Went way north of Florida, up into Canada. Uh, this is uh, all happened in the early 16th century. And that, and that makes, uh, you know, Appalachian... Uh, one of the oldest surviving European place names in the U.S., or, you know, Appalachia. So that's where the term uh, Appalachia comes from. The Spanish interpret it as meaning anything north of central Florida. So how come I keep choosing to say Appalachia instead? Now I'll address that. Some people definitely think that saying Appalachia instantly signifies you as an outsider. And I would say for uh, most parts of the region, that's right. However, other people think that you saying Appalachia signifies you as an outsider. Uh, there is no complete consensus on the pronunciation among people who have lived in Appalachia or Appalachia for multiple generations. It can vary inside the same county, even inside the same city. As a broad generalization, people from the northern part of Appalachia are more likely to pronounce it like I just said, while people from the central and southern parts more likely to pronounce it Appalachia, especially in rural areas. And while no official large-scale census has ever taken place, I think that more people overall, quite a bit more, say Appalachia. An internet poll does agree with me in this assessment that I'll get to in a second here. And this is the oldest pronunciation for historical reasons I've made clear. Appalachia credited in most dictionaries as the first way the word was pronounced. Appalachia now officially also used, but didn't show up in those dictionaries uh, in, until much later. Dictionary.com, my go-to guide for most pronunciation uh, you know, issues, uh, outside of hearing native speakers talk on YouTube, actually lists four variations. Appalachia, Appalachia, <laughs> Appalachia and Appalachia for fuck's sake. Uh, Appalachian or Appalachian Americans, an active Facebook group with over 230,000 self-pronounced or claimed uh, self-proclaimed Appalachians who want to preserve, preserve their region's culture. Now I got my mouth all twisted up. Uh, they responded to a survey on how to pronounce Appalachia and 76% said that Appalachia is the way you say it. Only 14%, you know, said that Appalachia is the way you're supposed to pronounce it. I find that interesting because I feel like most emails I've gotten are from people who say, uh, you know, the only way you say it is Appalachia. And when my daughter Monroe heard me working on this episode at home a couple nights ago and practicing some pronunciations, uh, she couldn't believe anyone ever pronounced it as Appalachia. She'd never heard, heard that, but she spent her childhood west of the Mississippi entirely, Washington, Idaho, California. So she's only heard Appalachia. So why does anyone even fucking care how this word is supposed to be pronounced? In a word, tribalism. So people who can tell, you know, who is one of them and who's an outsider. And there have been historical moments where making that distinction has actually been pretty important. During the Prohibition era, how you said a town or a region's name could have helped identify you as from the area or not, trustworthy or not. Are you a local or are you maybe a federal agent looking to bust up some speakeasies and some moonshiners? For another example, during, say, a coal miner strike, are you a local on the side of the miners or are you some fucking Pinkerton? Sent in to bust some heads. Knowing who's from where uh, still matters to a lot of people today. Here's an example of that from a user on Quora. All right, I'm a Southerner from the Appalachian, so this is my area. Everyone I know from this area, family, friends, locals from my parts, down to the people all the way to the end of the range, the natives, all pronounce it as follows. Appalachia and Appalachian. How you pronounce this word has more meaning to those of us from the area than just mere differences in dialects. This is one of the words used to immediately identify you. If you pronounce it as Appalachians or Appalachians, or one of those trying to actually pronounce the ch and the I-A by trying to hint at the I and make the double A sound as an apple found in the spelling of the word, instead of saying it as described previously above, you have instantly given away your status as an outsider. And natives will mark you mentally as not one of us. So there you go. So I think Appalachia wins with Appalachia as an acceptable substitute. And I will say Appalachia because, you know, that's how the word is primarily pronounced where I'm from in the Northwest. And because for this region, you know, or, you know, I, uh, I'm an outsider as far as uh, Appalachia, you know, and I should present myself as one, I guess. So now that we have all that shit cleared up, sort of, it's fucking crazy, right? How these things develop. Uh, nothing I choose and no justification will satisfy everyone. Uh, what is Appalachia? It's a geographical and cultural region of the Eastern United States. It's the area that surrounds the Appalachian Mountains, which helped define the territory. 
Appalachia stretches from southern New York to northern parts of Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia. According to most, it's made up of 422 or 420 counties across 13 states and spans about 205,000 square miles. Uh, the region's approximately 25 million residents live in parts of Alabama, Georgia, Kentucky, Maryland, Mississippi, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, and uh, all of West Virginia. Fuck yeah. West Virginia not dicking around when it comes to Appalachia. Not just uh, dipping their toes in. They pushed all their cultural chips into the poker pot. Uh, no area uh, of the U.S. east of the Mississippi has ever felt more like the area I grew up in in northern central Idaho, like parts of West Virginia. Specifically Huntington. So far away from where I grew up, but uh, when I was there, it uh, felt like home. Uh, the Appalachian Mountains themselves actually stretch all the way from Canada to Alabama, but the cultural region we call Appalachia traditionally only includes the central and southern portions of the range. Uh, the named ranges that make up the Appalachian Mountain Range basically cover the entire East Coast from the Shikshok and Notre Dame Ranges in Quebec to the White Mountains of New Hampshire, the Catskill Mountains of New York, the Blue Ridge Range in southern Pennsylvania and the Carolinas, and there's a ton more, the Allegheny Mountains, uh, Pennsylvania, the Great Smoky Mountains, the Cumberland Mountains. The highest elevation uh, in the Appalachians are in the northern division with Maine's Mount Katahdin, uh, 5,268 feet. New Hampshire's Mount Washington, 6,288 feet. There are other pinnacles in the White Mountains rising above 5,000 feet. And in the southern region, peaks of the North Carolina Black Mountains and the Tennessee, North Carolina Great Smoky Mountains rise above 6,000 feet. The highest summit, Mount Mitchell, 6,684 feet. A large distinctive geographic feature of the uh, Appalachians is the Great Appalachian Valley. Great Appalachian Valley includes the St. Lawrence River Valley in Canada, the uh, Kittatinny, Cumberland, Shenandoah, and Tennessee Valleys in the U.S. In terms of geographical features, waterfalls, streams, rivers are common throughout much of the uh, Appalachian system. Appalachian, Jesus Christ. Uh, generally temperate and humid, the climate of the Appalachians presents a uh, sharp contrast. No surprises there, given that at least geographically, Appalachia stretches basically the entire East Coast. One thing that most of these areas do have in common is uh, heavy clouds and haze. Uh, smoke and haze nourishes the abundant plant life in the river systems. Plant life includes deciduous forests, conifers, sugar maples, uh, buckeyes, beaches, ash, birch, red and white oaks. In the north, farther south, there's hickory, walnut, poplar, sycamore, and chestnuts. All those, plus, uh, you know, around 140 species of uh, additional trees found in the southern mountain region. I've driven through so much of it and uh, so much natural beauty in those mountains. So green, rocky tree-covered crags, quick and clear mountain streams. It is gorgeous. Uh, in terms of animals, sightings of bison, elk, and wolves were once common in the Appalachians but disappeared long ago. However, uh, elk are returning to the northern Appalachian mountains, Appalachian mountains, while caribou and moose have never left the northernmost areas. Scattered throughout other areas, black bear, white-tailed deer, wild boar, foxes, raccoons, beavers, other numerous small animals, perhaps cryptids, like the Rocky Branch giant rape beetle. Maybe not that one, please God. But maybe the whirling wimpus. Maybe, of course, the sheep squatch. Name, geography, basic known uh, flora and fauna, plants and animals now covered, at least briefly. Let's get more into some of the human history and culture of the region. Obviously, Appalachia. Uh, home to American Indians long before Europeans arrived. We just learned that's where the name comes from. Uh, various tribes, including the uh, Penacock, uh, Mohican, uh, Susquehanna, inhabited the northern half of the Appalachians for centuries before European settlement. In the southern mountains, the Cherokee were the primary tribe to live in hunts, but there were many others, like uh, some of the Creek. Though originally European settlement was primarily confined to the East Coast, interconnected trails for trade and exploration would soon bring settlers into the heart of Appalachia. Once the British were defeated in the Revolutionary War, Americans were free to colonize the interior of the country. And they did so with gusto in the spirit of manifest destiny. We went over that concept at length in the Oregon Trail Suck. The U.S. deciding, uh, you know, that expanding westward was God's will and that God wanted Christians, white Christians, preferably men, definitely straight men who loved puss, but not too much to get into adultery and whatnot, to take everything they could for the glory of America. Uh, that concept wasn't part of a national campaign like it would be in the early and mid-19th century, but it existed culturally for all practical purposes. If you wanted land at the end of the 18th century, cheap land, lots of it. You headed west into Appalachian. You fucking took it from any non-U.S. citizen in your way. 
Uh, before European settlements, there were over 50 Cherokee towns and settlements in southern Appalachia connected by a system of foot trails, many of which later would become wagon roads. Uh, then, as listeners of the Trail of Tears suck, will remember Cherokee other tribes uh, driven out by warfare, government-sanctioned, forced eviction by the mid-19th century. Even after a large amount of tribal removal, the rugged region was still not going to be settled easily or simply. The Appalachian Mountains were the first formidable barrier to early pioneers heading west, a precursor to the even more formidable Rocky Mountains that would come later. The size and complexity of the Appalachian uh, mountain ranges, the rugged courses of the many streams and rivers, the dense forests made it difficult to travel into and throughout much of the area. The wilderness of Appalachia became a frontier for exploration and living in the late 18th century. Daniel Boone, one of my mom's nicknames for me, my whole life. Daniel Boone, whose 1775 expedition through Virginia's Cumberland Gap into Kentucky uh, established a settlement route for settlers moving west. He became the first folk hero of America's pioneer era. He founded Fort Boonesboro, one of the very first U.S. outposts uh, of any sort on the west side of the Appalachians because the central Appalachians, uh, modern-day Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Tennessee had more spacious water gaps that enabled people to pass through more easily. These areas, once properly discovered, once word got out, attracted the largest numbers of early settlers. Many of these people were German and Scotch-Irish who went into the interior of Pennsylvania, then migrated down to the great Appalachian Valley into parts of present-day Virginia and Tennessee. They quickly found out that the area was rich in lumber, mineral resources, and animals for fur trading. But despite the early arrival of the lumber industry and the opening of the coal mines, some areas of Appalachia would remain isolated until early in the 20th century. Roughly a century into the settlement of Oregon, California, Utah, etc., parts of West Virginia, other areas of Appalachia, still real rugged, not real settled. Notably, the mountain areas in southern Appalachia, where rough, uh, where rough terrain made building roads damn near impossible, uh, it developed a distinctive culture. This culture became characterized by handcrafted wares, ballads, folklore. This culture became what the area known as Appalachia would become known for overall. Hog folk, dog folk! Yeah, <laughs> yeah! The culture of Appalachia consists of arts, crafts, food, myths, folklore, multiple ethnic influences, African, German, Native American, but mostly known for none of that mostly characterized by the hillbilly stereotype. And that stereotype did not magically appear out of nowhere. It has very real roots. Uh, the groups I just referenced all blended together into a cultural melting pot that essentially defined Americana as we know it today. But I didn't mention the biggest ingredient in that pot by far, possibly as high as 90% of Appalachian settlers in the 18th and 19th centuries were Scots-Irish, aka Scotch-Irish. Isn't that fucking crazy? 90%. The overwhelming majority were descendants of Ulster Protestants whose ancestors had migrated to Northern Ireland from the Scottish lowlands. Many had been supporters of William of Orange, a.k.a. William III, the Protestant King of Scotland, England and Ireland, affectionately known as King Billy among the Scots. When former King James II invaded Ireland in 1689, William's followers, known as Billy Boys, hid out in forests along the hills for sneak attacks upon the enemy. These fuckers were a wild bunch. Right, Some later 13th, early 14th century, William Wallace blood still running through their veins. Freedom! Right? Those guys. Uh, when they came to America, New England was already full of British settlers. And these so-called hillbillies settled in the wilderness of the Appalachian mountain range where the land was cheaper and where they wouldn't be bothered by some uppity, posh, Brit fucks. One notable person and a time suck alum whose parents were hillbillies, dude who was Plum, full of hillbilly blood himself, Andrew motherfucking Jackson. As I said a long time ago in Andrew Suck, uh, Scots from the highlands of Scotland called hill folk. Many of those hill folk also called as a hillbilly boys, as I said. These terms combined into hillbilly boys. That term eventually shortened to hillbillies. And that name followed these immigrants to colonial America. And these hillbilly immigrants were not nobles. They were not highfalutin merchants and whatnot. They were largely poor, fiercely self-reliant, with an innate distrust of the government after decades of fighting the English and Catholics. And that is where the Appalachian cultural stereotypes such as family loyalty, rebellion against authority, a passion for self-defense gave rise to the image of hillbillies as wild, reclusive mountain men. A lot of that hog folk, dog folk, clannish shit is real. And some of those wild-eyed fuckers are my ancestors that I spoke of in the Andrew Jackson suck. I didn't have the 23 and me results back then yet, but now I do. They say I'm 55.8% British and Irish. Only 20%. Hangy bangy. Swedish, Norwegian. Thought it'd be more. 
just the way the genes express themselves in each person. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if roughly 100% of the 55.8% of me from the UK is all hillbilly. My direct ancestors, like one generation above, still very passionate about self-defense, reclusive, rebellious, distrustful of the government and just any large organization, corporate America, the church. My dad kept a loaded gun in every different room of our house the last few years I was in high school. Super worried about the possibility of intruders coming in and stealing the only things he had of value, which would have been the guns. Uh, he had tax issues because he didn't trust the government. Didn't like paying the you know, government, you know, taking shit. Who does really? But you know, distrustful of the government enough to uh, always have some version of, we'll drive to this remote location if trilateral forces try and enslave us. You know, we can live off the grid. Uh, hid literal bags of gold dust in the walls at one point because he was worried about the U.S. economy collapsing and having to fucking live off the land and trade in gold, I guess. I have uncles with very similar dispositions. My dad's no longer paranoid like he used to be. Doesn't try and start fist fights with people anymore. But he used to have, uh, you know, a lot of hot blood in him. A lot of hillbilly. A lot of, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of quick temper. And so did most of his brothers, you know? They'd fight, fist fight. You know, it's grown men sometimes. Uh, you know, between family members and strangers alike, they'd fight. Generation before my dad, even wilder. Uh, my grandpa was like a boxing champion in his, uh, his I don't know, uh, it wasn't his unit in the, in the in Korean war, but in uh, some region. And he was real, he was a pastor, also a real feisty dude. Very, very feisty. M- most of my friends have thought I'm the wild and crazy one of the bunch. And I feel like most of my hillbilly ancestors would be very disappointed in how comparatively tame I am, right? Why am I not out there fucking punching people? Uh, this group of Scots, Irish, these true hillbillies, people like uh, most of the branches of my family tree, they're the basis of the modern wary-eyed, banjo-playing, dirty feet having remote cabin in the woods. You ain't from around here, are you? Backwood stereotype. But these people, not the only group that settled in Appalachia and helped create its culture. Important to note, you know, major part of the culture, but not the only part. German immigrants, who are often referred to as Dutch by hillbillies because they came from Deutschland. Uh Uh-huh, a lot of my ancestors, not real solid with the book learning. Uh, Another group had a huge influence on Appalachian culture. They primarily settled in Northern and Central Appalachia in Pennsylvania and Virginia, uh, uh, bringing with them food such as apple butter. Oh, God, love it. Sauerkraut. Uh, traditions such as chinked corner cabins, chinking the material that fits between the imperfect joints of logs to ensure a seal in a log cabin from external elements like uh, or elements like rain, snow, sleet, while keeping heat, you know, uh, inside, cool air inside in summer. It's like caulking. Uh, their cultural identity was so strong they did not assimilate very well. They had their own German schools and churches. You can still feel their influence today in a few little parts of Appalachia, little alpine towns like little Switzerland, North Carolina, Helen, Georgia. Uh, Both those towns came later than the Scots-Irish invasion, not forming until the early 20th century, though. And uh, the Germans, you know, uh, they did tend to come over after the Scots-Irish. And they were treated considerably less harshly in America than Scots-Irish immigrants before them, who were not well-liked by many British colonists and really not well-liked by almost any other settlers. Clannish, distrustful, hot-headed, maybe not the best qualities in a neighbor. Uh, another interesting but rarely discussed Appalachian cultural influence, that of the Scandinavians, particularly people from Finland and Sweden, the Hoingi Boingis. They brought with them woodworking skills, uh, which gave rise to log cabins in the Blue Ridge area, cut so well they didn't even need any chinking. Logs leveled perfectly, no spaces left between them. Those Hoingi Boingi carpenters, I have several of them in the family tree as well. Oh, they're impressive builders. Although Appalachia is often thought of as a rural, primarily Caucasian region, African-Americans have inhabited the area for hundreds of years. In fact, by 1860, an estimated 10% of the Appalachian region's population was black. America's early pioneer era saw whites, blacks, Indians, all living close together in the Appalachian range. Uh, This gave rise in the early 19th century to a regional multiracial group originated in Southern Appalachia, known as Melungeons, who had a blend of African, European, and uh, native ancestry. And the African influence on Appalachia persists uh, today in a big way, most notably in the banjo. Yes, the banjo, the stringed instrument central to bluegrass, other forms of Appalachian music, hands down the musical mascot of Appalachia originated in Africa. Did you know that? That the banjo comes from Africa? I did, of course, because I have an online triple doctorate in every and anything banjo from the A-Hole Air Banjo Academy. No, I didn't know that. Uh, let's go on a little little banjo history lesson, since no instrument is associated with Appalachia like the banjo. Oh, 
Oh yeah. Oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah, go. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Woo wee. A little bit of deliverance there. A little dueling banjos. That's a great scene. Uh, European explorers as early as the uh, 16th century encountered what they uh, called a gourd with neck and strings on expeditions to Africa. And African slaves brought versions of the instrument to the New World by 1620, several sources have said. Uh, Banjo-like instruments then proliferated during the days of slavery with early versions made from uh, calabash gourds and animal skin heads attached with nails or tacks. Some had a flat, fretless neck. Many had three or four strings made of whatever material was at hand. As early as 1769, white minstrels impersonating African-American musicians by playing banjos and performing in blackface. Eek. Were common. Uh, by the 1840s, minstrel shows had gained great popularity, and Joel Walker Sweeney, a white minstrel performer, became famous for his proficiency on the banjo. Some historians consider Sweeney the first musician to use the drum-like configuration Excuse me, of the modern-day banjo, uh, though other authorities dispute that claim. Uh, while Sweeney's portrayal of African Americans, obviously appalling, and uh, you know, by today's standards, homeboy would get uh, rightfully culturally annihilated if he did that shit today, uh, he contributed a lot to the popularity of the instrument. That would influence a lot of subsequent American music. He was the first performer to use the banjo in a professional setting. Uh, wasn't the first to employ the fifth string, but he popularized it. Before long, other players added a fifth string, the shortest on the banjo, typically used to produce a drone note. Uh, Sweeney inspired other musicians to take up the banjo, even worked with the Baltimore drum maker to produce banjos for sale to the public. And a lot of people bought and played these hillbilly harps, almost all of them around Appalachia. Not sure if anyone actually calls them hillbilly harps, but I do hope that term catches on now and I'm, I'm given proper credit. Uh, and the Civil War then became the true catalyst for the instrument's popularity. The conflict brought people from throughout the nation into close contact, exposing many to the banjo for the first time. In some regions, the instrument had been familiar only in barrooms and racetracks before the war. Fuck yeah, bro! Fighting, racing, some goddamn hillbilly harp. Let's go. Let's 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 go. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's some heavy metal banjo harp. Played by a guy in a mountain man beard, dirty cowboy hat, overalls, and I don't think anything else. Perfect. Uh, white musicians in Appalachia began adapting European folk songs and fiddle tunes to the banjo, resulting in the traditions explored and modified in the 1940s and the folk music boom in the 60s. Uh, many trace the source of much of modern original American music to the combination of fiddle and banjo. Bluegrass originated in the 1940s in Appalachia. Bluegrass has its roots mainly in traditional Scottish and Irish ballads and dance tunes. So interesting stuff, right? And then the summer of 2018, the next evolution in banjo music was born. You may remember that is when the air banjo debuted. Check out how I can spice up that dueling uh, banjo jamboree you heard earlier with some solid next level air banjo licks. Bang, dong, bang, dong, ding, ding. Pink, tong, 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 tank, 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 Dance in the dirt. I bet a few of them just couldn't even help themselves listening to this episode. Be careful if you're driving, you know, listen to some of these episodes because I'm sure many of you felt compelled just to dance with joy when that was going on. Anyway, uh, before moving on, one of the sources I found uh, for the history of the banjo included some uh, Appalachian banjo jokes. I had not, <laughs> I had not heard these before. I don't know why I would. Uh, now I, I don't want to have to be the one who experienced them, you know, alone. So here, here you go. What's the difference between a banjo and a lawnmower. <laughs> you can tune a lawnmower. <laughs> Come on. What's the difference between a dead skunk in the middle of the road and a dead banjo player in the middle of the road? There are skid marks in front of the skunk. <laughs> All right. You get it. How many banjo players does it take to eat a possum? Two. One to eat it. The other to watch for cars. Come on. One more. What do you call 100 banjos at the bottom of the ocean? A good start. <laughs> Going back to African-American. Appalachian influences now. Uh, not only did they bring the banjo, but the people of the Afro-Caribbean uh, uh, diaspora, oh, those fancy-ass words, also introduced uh, foods such as sorghum, uh, sorghum cane, uh, sweet potatoes, black-eyed peas, watermelon, and peanuts into Appalachian cuisine. Kentucky-based writer Frank X. Walker coined the term uh, 
Afrolatcha in the 1990s as a means to bring awareness to the cultural influence of African Americans in Appalachia. All these cultures, mostly Scots, Irish, uh, but with a bit of German, Scandinavian, African mixed in, blended together to form Appalachian culture in the 1800s. So what else characterizes Appalachian culture? First, religion. Christianity long been the main religion of Appalachia. Uh, religion in Appalachia characterized by a sense of independence and a distrust of religious hierarchies stemming from early immigrants' Protestant roots. A lot of non-denominational churches. Uh, some 18th and 19th century religious traditions still practiced in parts of Appalachia, including natural water, a.k.a. creek baptism, rhythmically chanted preaching, congregational shouting, snake handling, and foot washing. Don't need no priest now here for God. This here rattlesnake. Bring me the Lord just fine. Don't tread on me. Power of the Lord, protect me from the serpent. Uh, while most church uh, goers in Appalachia attend fairly well-organized churches affiliated with regional or national bodies now. Uh, small, unaffiliated congregations still common in rural mountain areas, and some of these congregations have for sure helped fuel certain hillbilly stereotypes. Snake handling, that rare Christian denomination, uh, it did rise in Appalachia. Bone, bone in the mountains of Appalachia. Uh, not common in Appalachia. You know, way more people do not handle snakes there than do, but still more snake handlers uh, in Appalachia than any other part of America. Snake handling began in uh, near Chattanooga, Tennessee in 1910, when Pastor George Hensley said he was commanded by God to take up serpents. Funny if he did hear a voice, but it was just like a neighbor pranking him. You know, just some dude outside his window. Hey, George, George grab the serpent. Grab, take up the serpent, grab the snake. Uh, Hensley helped to spread this style of worship throughout the region by the 1930s. It became so popular that by the, by the 1940s, most state legislatures in Appalachia had banned it because there'd been a rash of deaths Pastor Hensley himself died of a snake bite after being bitten roughly 400 fucking times <laughs> over the course of so many uh, terrifying sermons and demonstrations. Uh, another defining hallmark of stereotypical Appalachian culture, the hillbilly dialect, right? Uh, this again does not come from nowhere. Most people in Appalachia these days do not speak with it, but a lot of folks do still have that classic redneck accent. This distinctive dialect is uh, directly related to old world Scottish dialects has a much stronger Scottish influence than other American dialects. So it does come from somewhere. Uh, Appalachian hillbilly is America's, you know, Scottish accent. Check out this little clip from a 2004 Appalachian documentary called Mountain Talk, featuring, and I shit you not, Popcorn Sutton and Jim Tom Hedrick. Popcorn and Jim Tom. Yeah, <laughs> woo bingo bango. Tars, I'll call them Tars. They used to call them casings years ago. You ever hear anybody said, hook them casings on that vehicle? <laughs> That's what they called them before World War II. Yeah, it was casings. Uh -huh. Then I called them tars. You know. <laughs> Hell yeah. Looked them tars, looked them tars. <laughs> and they call them tires. <laughs> they call them tires and I call them, I call them tars. <laughs> yeah. Oh, folks, you know, I talk about their tires. I'm like, no, it's like a tars. Uh, the real backwoods rural central Idaho accent surprisingly very similar to this, I might add. It comes very natural to me. Also, what are the odds that either uh, Popcorn or Jim Tom know their way around a banjo? Fucking 100%? I mean, at least one of them has to play right or dabble in moonshine or have a killer recipe for squirrel stew or all of the above. Uh, rural isolation, not to be demeaning, but a real lack of formal education as well, hardened this dialect for many people in Appalachia. It's a, it's a poor folks accent, you know, where it's uh, more important to speak plain, to be real than it is to uh, maybe sound uppity, overly educated, and like an outsider. Fear of the halls of academia. Seen a lot recently with the rising distrust of science, see, uh, see Flat Earth and many other conspiracy groups. You know, that's nothing new. And not always without merit, right? The poor and un uneducated have been manipulated, oppressed, fucked over by, you know, comparatively more educated elite from most of human history. Feudal Europe didn't work out real well for the peasant. English kings, by and large, didn't make life grand for the Scots-Irish peasants. So distrustful of uh, formalities. A plain, full of slang, and formal way of speaking has, has become a badge of honor for many poor groups of people throughout history. Hillbillies being one of them. Uh, speaking of education, let's address this aspect of the Appalachian hillbilly stereotype. For much of the region's history, education in Appalachia uh, has in fact lagged behind the rest of the nation. For most of the region's history, there hasn't been much perceived need for formal education for a population oriented towards farming and uh, other industry. Early education in the region evolved from teaching Christian morality and learning to read the Bible in small one-room schoolhouses that convened only during the months when kids not needed to help with farm work. 
reading the classics, learning deductive reasoning, appreciating Greek philosophy or world history. Not big priorities for the popcorns and Jim Toms of the world. Not when there's farming to be done, a hillbilly harp, jamboree to be had, and some squirrel meat to get eaten. To, ha, eaten, they would have fucking, they would have, outsider, get on out of here, to get eight. I'm sorry, I said it wrong. After the Civil War, mandatory education laws and state assistance did begin to help many larger uh, communities begin to establish graded schools, high schools, later universities. Uh, are the Appalachians still uneducated? An educational gap between Appalachia and the rest of the nation, once considered wide, don't have exact stats for it since uh, these stats just weren't collected in the 18th and 19th centuries like they are now. That gap is still there, but is shrinking. Following stats come from the results of a report concluded in 2019 by ARC, the Appalachia Regional Commission. 87.2% of Appalachian adults aged 25 and over have earned a high school diploma, very similar to the U.S. average of 88%. Uh, the share of adults uh, ages 25 and over in the region with at least a bachelor's degree rose by 2.5 percentage points since 2010 through 2014, now exceeds 24% compared to the national average of 32%. However, in central Appalachia, the heart of the mountains, places like West Virginia, the share of adults ages 25 and over with at least a bachelor's degree sits at just 15.2%, 18.3% as points lower than the national, uh, lower than the national average. So a lot of work still to be done. Why less education? You know, I explained, you know, with the jobs, but also, you know, part of the reason poverty, less people having enough money uh, to continue with their education. Appalachia, historically and today, comparatively poorer than the rest of the U.S. In the 1960s, Appalachia had the highest poverty rate and percentage of working poor in the nation. Roughly one third of the region's population was living in poverty. According to the uh, ARC's 2010-2014 poverty rate report, poverty rates across the U.S. 15.6% compared to 19.7% in the combined Appalachian regions of Alabama, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia. In 2014, the per capita income of the Appalachian region of Kentucky, only $30,308, while the average for the entire U.S., $46,049. The number for the region taken as a whole com uh, comes out to 37260 which is only uh, just over 80% of the U.S. average per capita income. That's a lot less. The average person in the U.S. making, uh, you know, just over $3,800 a month. Average person in Appalachia making $3,100 a month. Appalachian to Kentucky pulling uh, just over $2,500 a month. Dude's name fucking Jim Tom and Popcorn probably pulling in about 50 bucks a month. Uh, JK, those dudes could be fucking killing it. I don't know. I just want an excuse to say their names again. Uh, prior to COVID-19, the Appalachian region was seeing improvements in income and poverty. We'll see how it shakes out now. Uh, median household income increased 8% between 2010, 2014, and 2015 and 2019 with increases reaching at least 15% in almost 60 counties scattered throughout the region. Uh, despite these improvements, Appalachian homes still only pull in 82.6% of the nation's average median household income. So why is there more poverty overall in Appalachia than in the rest of the U.S.? One of the oldest and most controversial explanations for uh, Appalachia's underdevelopment in both education and income is what some scholars call the culture of poverty. Developed in the 60s, when social scientists wanted to explain the disparity in Appalachian's incomes, the culture of poverty theory holds that Appalachian culture, with its fatalist, uh, fatalistic outlook and encouragement of laziness, is ill-suited to the modern economy. Under this theory, the solution to Appalachia's poverty is simple. To change the mountains is to change the mountain personality, as sociologist Rupert Vance put it. The culture, culture of poverty explanation has uh, been widely criticized by Appalachian study scholars for drawing on and reinforcing stereotypes of Appalachian people as being isolated, lazy hillbillies. I'm guessing Popcorn and Jim Tom, not fans of this theory at all. No one puts in a harder eight-hour shift than fucking Popcorn. I don't know. Uh, the culture of poverty explanation also informs J.D. Vance's argument in Hillbilly Elegy, uh, which he describes as a book about a culture that increasingly encourages social decay in the context of regional economic decline. Uh, another popular explanation of Appalachian underdevelopment is what's called the resource curse. This one uh, makes sense to me. The idea that places with a lot of natural resources are likely to be poor because resource industries like coal mining, they dominate the local economy and prevent other economic sectors from growing. Appalachia is a place with abundant resources like coal, minerals, land, you know, uh, timber, forest, right? Main jobs, you know, lumbering, mining, farming, historically. None of these jobs need a high school edu or high education. Employers don't decide the job based on education level. A diploma has not been a priority in job finding in this region for much of its history. 
many kids of school age, you know, drop out of school to help their family work. I think that, yeah, that is an interesting theory. I would not have come up with that explanation on my own. It makes sense to me. If a good living wage comes easy, thanks to abundant natural resources and extracting those resources doesn't require a lot of education. Well, that removes a lot of incentive, uh, you know, for that education for a lot of people. No, you can make, you can make $60,000 a year right out of high school working in this mine, or you can go to school for four more years, take out a bunch of loans and then maybe make $60,000 a year doing something else. You know, you can make hundred thousand dollars a year as a union lineman for utility company, no college needed, never have to not be called popcorn or maybe make $70,000 a year as a social worker. If you have your master's degree and you have a supervisor insist that you do ditch the name popcorn. Uh, another theory to explain regional poverty is the internal colony model. This is very interesting, I think. Uh, developed in the 1970s to provide a political explanation for Appalachia's poverty. The internal colony model likens Appalachia's relationship to the rest of America to that of a colony with its colonizer. Under this theory, out-of-state companies come into the region, exploit rich natural resources, corrupt local governments to ensure their control, leave ordinary Appalachian people with very little control over their local economic circumstances. The rich and educated taking advantage of the poor and uneducated. That narrative, that's been around, you know, ever since some people figured out how to be fucking educated and got rich. The Rutherfords and the Ebenezers exploiting the fucking Jim Toms and the popcorns. So if Appalachians are uneducated or undereducated and comparatively poor, you know, it's not entirely their fault. So why does much of the media choose to focus on the poor and undereducated when there are plenty of other people living in the region? Maybe because it's fun to do that accent. I mean, come on, it's a fun, it's a fun way to talk. I do fucking love doing it. That doesn't seem to be the reason scholars point uh, to here. The rise of the Appalachian hillbilly stereotype, the figure in the modern national consciousness, uh, began in the 1960s during poverty tours, political parades with stops in uh, rural central Appalachia that President John F. Kennedy uh, took, uh, Russia journalists followed. During this period, Appalachia became synonymous with rural white poverty. The tours failed to show the diversity of the region. The journalists just focused on the impoverished. And once interest was shown in poor Appalachian hillbillies, some media members started to spin shit to sell more ads, right? Same old story. Exaggerate the narrative to increase sales, push some propaganda. Clear example of this was when a woman sued the Lexington Herald for publishing a photograph of her kids playing in a stream. The photograph was supposed to frame these kids as impoverished and dirty, but they weren't. They were just kids just having fucking fun with their mom. Uh, the photograph taken without her permission. Images like these uh, were used by media makers whenever subsequent presidents stated they wanted to end poverty in America. And that linked Appalachia in the modern consciousness to poor, destitute white people. These images of an all-white populace, depressed-looking men hunched over from years of working in the mines, dirty-faced, barefoot kids, women in shift dresses, holding babies in one arm, cooking on a wood stove with the other, that has defined Appalachia for at least two generations now. But there's so much more to the region than rural, comparatively uneducated poverty. Right? There's, uh, you know, 30, uh, pri uh, 34, excuse me, private uh, liberal arts colleges, four-year schools in the Appalachian College Association. So many additional four-year schools not in that association. So many public universities as well. Plenty of master's and doctoral programs. Uh, West Virginia University, one of uh, many of Appalachia's public institutions, Go Mountaineers, offers doctorates in biomedical sciences, clinical and translational science biomedical engineering and more. I just got two WVU doctorates last week as a fucking prize in a box of Cracker Jacks. Come on, come on. <laughs> no, just JK. Uh, those are uh, very well-respected programs. It's just a few of many. Uh, there are cities as well. It's not all just rural. Uh, Pittsburgh, the biggest city in Appalachia, 2.3 million for the metro area. Uh, and lots of, you know, uh, successful artistic people have come out of the area. Gertrude Stein, Nellie Bly, uh, Michael Shabon, Willa Cather, just a few heralded uh, Appalachian authors. Andy Warhol, Philip Perlstein, Robert Qualters, some incredible Appalachian artists. Uh, Dwight Yoakam, Wiz Khalifa, Chet Atkins, Loretta Lynn, Crystal Gale. Just a few successful musicians from the area. Steve Harvey, Brad Dorff, Jennifer Gar Garner. Just a few entertainment personalities from Appalachia. And I could go on and on, but you get it. The backwood stereotype doesn't come from thin air, but that stereotype does not define all of Appalachia. Not even close. Plenty of diversity in a very big area. Also, plenty of woods and places for weird, creepy cryptids to hide. Creatures that might be nothing more than the products of overactive imaginations. Fantastical creatures. Born in Appalachian mines. Raised on folk stories rooted partially in Scottish and Irish fairy tales. And a regional tradition of telling tall tales in some of Appalachia's more isolated areas. Or 
creatures that are strange and not proven, but possibly very real. More real than the Rocky Branch giant rape beetle, perhaps. Let's finally, now that we have a better understanding of the culture surrounding these cryptids, real or fake, let's meet some of them in today's Time Suck Timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time-suck timeline. Let's start way back at the dawn of the 13th century, before Europeans arrived in the Appalachian region. According to a possible Cherokee legend, this is disputed, uh, around 1200 CE, a great battle was fought between the Cherokee and uh, Catawba Indians at Brown Mountain. And ever since... Mysterious lights have been spotted in the area, and the lights are thought by some to be the souls or ghosts of tribal maidens still searching for their men who died in battle. One of the many theories about the mysterious Brown Mountain lights. (laughs) Brown Mountain uh, sounds like the destination for a Cleveland Steamers MC run. (laughs) Okay, guys, uh, let's make a run for Brown Mountain uh, just on the backside of Yellow River. (laughs) I remember playing that golden water as a kid. Mom used to say I liked the water so much I'd, I'd ask to take a shower. In the river instead of in the tub. <laughs> can you believe it? I'd say, Mom, uh, can you help give me a golden shower before we ride over to Brown Mountain to find that train tunnel? Golden showers and exploring Brown Mountain Tunnel with Mom, that's about as good as childhood as any guy could ask for, <laughs> if you ask me. Anyway, I'm Tooch Martinez. I hope you get to check out my uh, Outlaw Motorcycle ch- Club chapter. Uh, I'll refocus now. In the 1730s, when German immigrants began to settle around the area, that would become Frederick County, Maryland. Uh, these uh, German immigrants allegedly began to encounter something called a Schnellergeist, meaning quick spirit. The earliest incarnations of the creature mixed the half-bird features of a Greek siren with the nightmarish features of demons and ghouls. Later reports by the end of the 18th century would describe this beast as half-reptile. It would become known as the Snallygaster for some reason. Stories will uh, evolve to rumors of this beast swooping silently from the sky to pick up and carry off victims, suck the blood of its victims, Seven pointed stars, which reputedly kept the Snallygaster at bay, still can be seen painted on local barns in the area. More detailed encounters to come of this creature. Uh, 1770, uh, 1771, German scientist attempts to explain the Brown Mountain lights off North Carolina or of North Carolina, saying that they are inflamed nitrous vapors, but that is instantly disputed. Mountain folk don't want to hear no science vapor mumbo jumbo about no monster lights. 1797, writer Benjamin Barton writes about the Cherokee legend of the moon-eyed people. According to Barton, human-like beings once lived in central Appalachia that were called moon-eyed peoples. Their eyes saw very poorly during the day, had excellent vision at night. They were a nocturnal people. Reminds me a little bit of vampires without any uh, real, like, you know, powerful abilities. Uh, Early settlers hearing about the moon-eyed people speculated they were either a different race or that they were early European settlers who had somehow changed to become nocturnal after years of living in the new world. There are all these theories out there about uh, Welsh people, perhaps, you know, coming over centuries before Columbus. Uh, today, the Georgia Parks Division of the Department of Natural Resources has a marker at Fort Mountain, just east of Chatsworth, that mentions legends about a wall in the mountain's origin. Uh, there are stone piles without mortar on the mountains thought to be the remains of the fortification of some ancient people, the moon eyed people. The plaque says these people are said to have been unable to see during certain phases of the moon. During one of these phases, the Creek people annihilated this race. Some believe the Moon-Eyed people built these fortifications on the mountain. Back in 1797, Benjamin Barton cited Colonel Leonard Marbury, an intermediary between the government and the Cherokee, writing, The Cherokee tell us that when they first arrived in the country which they inhabit, they found it possessed by a certain Moon-Eyed people who could not see in the daytime. These wretches they expelled. Why were they wretches? What do they do? Uh, In his book, Barton infers that the Moon-Eyed people were ancestors of albinos, encountered by Lionel Wafer, a Welsh explorer in the early 18th century. And there have been, uh, you know, uh, there are Moon-Eyed people in other regions of Appalachia too, supposedly. There's a mention of Moon-Eyed people uh, from Cherokee legends in Ohio. Uh, Author Barbara Alice Mann, who identifies herself as Ohio Bear Clan Seneca, uh, suggests that a Moon-Eyed people of Cherokee tradition were Adena people from Ohio who merged with the Cherokees around 200 BCE. Uh, the Adena existed uh, from 500 BCE to around uh, 100 CE and built substantial earthwork mounds thought to be the remnants of ceremonial sites. Their culture was centered in Ohio. The moon eyed people have been described as short, bearded, white-skinned people living in America long before the arrival of Columbus. Who are these people? No one knows. But I feel like there's a decent chance that Popcorn, Jim Tom, might have some moon eyed blood running through their veins. Let's skip ahead to July 21st, 1806 now. On this day, Chimney Rock a high stone outcropping near Asheville, North Carolina, 
can be seen for miles, the site of one of the oddest series of events ever recorded in North Carolina. In the first few years of the 19th century, residents around the rock reported uh, a number of highly unusual sightings. The story begins on July 31st, 1806, when, uh, sorry, I think I said, uh, uh, yeah, 21st earlier. It is the 31st. It's very important. Those 10 days mean everything, but it is the 31st. Uh, when eight-year-old Elizabeth Reeves, whose family lived in Buncombe County near Chimney Rock, told her older brother that she had been, uh, she had, excuse me, seen a man, a flying man on top of Chimney Rock. Her brother refused to believe her. But when she persuaded him to go look, young Morgan Reeves saw not just one, but thousands of people. He really upped the ante. Flying through the air around Chimney Rock. The people uh, the Reeves children saw were described as beans clothed in brilliant white, ranging in size from infant to adult. While they were generally human in shape, the children could uh, not make out distinct features. Uh, there was no clear differentiation in age or gender to some of them. So I'm not sure how they how they could tell exactly what the infant to adult range. But anyway, are these angels? Flying moon-eyed people? Uh, the children called their mom, Patsy Reeves, who came running. Allegedly also saw this shit. All in all, six people saw the apparitions. Elizabeth, Morgan, Patsy, the youngest Reeves daughter, Polly, as well as a neighbor, Mr. Robert Searcy, and an unnamed African-American woman. According to the witnesses, the crowd of beans rose to the top of Chimney Rock. Then three members of the crowd rose higher than the others, hovered, and then led the congregation of shining beans up through the air to disappear into the heavens. All right. The account of the strange apparition, uh, or apparitions, printed a few weeks later in the Raleigh Register and Gazette, cited again in Edward Augusta, Edward Augustus Kendall's travels through the northern parts of the United States in the years 1807 and 1808. Then for five years, no one would spot these fucking weird flying people. Then in 1811, different witnesses now see two armies of these fuckers riding tiny winged horses. <laughs> Not kidding. Fighting a fierce battle in the air above Chimney Rock. Over the course of several evenings in the summer of that year, multiple witnesses in different locations around Chimney Rock would claim to see two opposing bands of cavalry uh, riding winged horses, tiny winged horses, circling each other in the sky. God, if they only had cell phone cameras back then. On the final evening, these two ar armies, I guess, finally engaged each other in a massive battle. They clashed in the sky over Chimney Rock. <laughs> it's pretty weird. You know, they just flew around thinking about fighting up in the air on tiny flying horses for a couple days. How tiny were these flying horses? I don't know. They're just described in sources specifically as tiny. Not small, tiny. Maybe that's why it took them a couple days to put the battle together, right? I like to picture these uh, horses being the size of like Pomeranians. But the warriors are regular sized. So it kind of looks like that old uh, poster image of like a circus bear riding a fucking tricycle or a little tiny bicycle. So hard not to fall off your tiny winged horse. So hard to balance. You, you know, you're, you have a jousting stick or a sword or I don't know, gun or something. You're trying to fight. Sheesh. Probably just took him a couple days to get real comfortable riding those tiny ass little saddles. Well, these special cavalrymen were allegedly armed with swords. And witnesses said they could hear the distant sounds of clashing metal. The groans of the wounded. The battle lasted around 10 minutes, at the end of which uh, the defeated army retreated and the victorious army disappeared into some darkness. Where did the darkness come from? The fucking wormhole open up in the sky? How many tiny horses were hurt in this sky battle? More importantly, how much moldy rye bread was eaten by these witnesses? This sounds like a, some hallucinatory ergot poisoning or something. Uh, newspapers across the state carried reports of the strange battle. A public meeting was actually held. I love it. In Rutherfordton, North Carolina which is a cute-ass-looking little town of about 4,000 people, by the way. Adorable Main Street. A lot of antebellum houses surrounding downtown. Uh, public speculation soon settled on the idea that the battle was a divine vision of highlights from the past, from the Revolutionary War. They, <laughs> they, had, a, they had a public meeting about all this. I, I think it's a, um, it's a, like a, mm, there's a universe of tiny horses uh, and sometimes the tiny horse universe gets caught over into arguments. No, come on. What are you talking about, Jim Tom? It's uh, obviously reenactors. It's obviously ghost revolutionary war reenactor. No, it's angels. And there's some, uh, listen, when horses go to heaven, they get shrunk. I don't know what the fuck they were talking about. Uh, I did get suck, uh, sucked into a fucking travel video for Rutherford 10, North Carolina. By the end, I was like, I could live there. Cool coffee shop, cool microbrew, museums, ice cream shops, friendly people. Only an hour from Asheville. You got me, Rutherford. <laughs> you got me, Rutherford tourism people. You hooked me in. I think your tiny sky horse story is total bullshit, but I do love your town. 
Uh, these weird visions, not actually cryptids, I guess. Let's let's jump to a creature story next. Kind of. The 1850s would see the belled buzzard. Maybe not so much of a frightening cryptid, more of just a bird with a fucking bell around its neck. But maybe a magical bird, but probably not. Cryptid-ish? The belled buzzard was a fearsome creature in American folklore, frequently cited as an omen of disaster by the sounding of its death bell. The animal is otherwise depicted as just a, you know, ordinary buzzard, but has a bell on its neck. The bell buzzard originated from uh, actual accounts of turkey vultures uh, with uh, bells tied to their necks. Bell buzzard story circulated principally throughout the southern U.S. And it's, it's the origin of the phrase, not enough sense to bell a buzzard. Fucking never heard that phrase ever in my life. But I guess it means you're stupid. Uh, reports of buzzards with bells appeared as early as the 1850s. Yeah, in the states of Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia. While sightings of the bell buzzard likely drawn from multiple buzzards. Eventually, the determiner, the, would standard, uh, you know, uh, standardly re- replace a or plural nouns. I'm sorry, or plural forms. Uh, prior to the 1880s, the belled buzzard would also be sighted in West Virginia, Delaware, Georgia, South Carolina. Uh, uh, however, it would be the belled buzzard's appearance in Brownsville, Tennessee, during the yellow fever epidemic of 1878 that first connected the animal with natural disaster. From then on, the belled buzzard legend grew to take a more ominous tone. Sounds like uh, sometimes when times got, you know, got tough, some assholes made them tougher by tying bells to buzzards, freaking people out. Sounds like something I would have done or would have wanted to do in my younger days. By 1885, the belled buzzard's range would expand to include the states of Maryland, Ohio, Kentucky, Mississippi, Texas, even New York. While most reports simply made mention of a sighting, those that elaborated further reinforced the bell buzzard's reputation as a harbinger of doom. One of my favorite phrases, a harbinger of doom. Never thought I'd hear it applied to a fucking buzzard with a bell around its neck. Newspaper article headings such as a bird of evil omen, a disaster feared with coming of belled buzzard, made it clear to readers that some fucked up shit is on the horizon. A reference by the Delaware Ledger on August 4th, 1883 read, we most sincerely hope that the belled buzzard that has been so, uh, been so frequently spoken of, our exchange will not locate in this section. It might be the forerunner of cholera. Unreal. Uh, Late 19th century journalist legitimately worried about buzzards with bells. Small uh, town Nebraskan paper in 1884 simply noted, a buzzard with a bell on its neck is frightening people in Maryland. They take it to be the angel of death. Years later, an article from May 5th, 1900, reported that three Georgia veterans, J.L. Gerald, H.C. Davis, and uh, G.K. Smith, while stationed in Tallahassee, Florida, did put a bell on a buzzard. In 1863, and that that was the belled buzzard that everyone was seeing. It was a prank. Hilarious. It is possible that this uh, started everything. Buzzards can live up to 25 years. They can uh, have quite a range of where they go. Uh, the article elaborated that a buzzard it captured at Fort Gaines, Georgia, was the same bird due to the alleged similarities in the bronze bell and a leather collar used. All right, maybe. Let's hear about a cooler creature now. Uh, in the Hagers, Hagerstown, Mail. From March 5th, 1871, residents were warned about a creature called the Tennessee Wild Man lurking in Piney in McNary County in West Tennessee. Piney? Whenever I hear that word, I think of an old song. Long time suckers know it. Sing along if you want to. Well, look here now. I got some pig. Taste this pig. I heard it lick out of my woman's beard. Well, look here now. With a full belly, I made a baby with a woman on mine. And the governor's wallet we got. Yeah, yeah. Uh, old Jersey Devil. Time set cut. Another wild-ass cryptic tale. Uh, Wrong piney for this story, though. Uh, This wild man supposedly approached women with wild, horrid screams while attempting to carry them off. He was described as tall, with great muscular strength and covered in dark, matted hair. He also ran with swiftness that defied both men and dogs. That wild man could outrun a hound. That's a speedy bitch. The full article read, uh, and I will read this in a stereotypical hillbilly accent complete with a banjo sound bed for dramatic effect. We learned that between Saba and Cranesville, and what is called Piney in McNary County, Tennessee, strange and frightful bean has been observed for several weeks. He is said to be seven feet high and possessed of great muscular power. His eyes are unusually large and fiery red. His hair hangs in a tangle and matted mass below his waist, and his beard reaches below his middle. His entire body is covered with hair, and his whole aspect is most frightful. He shuns the sight of them, but approaches with wild and horrid screams of delight every woman who is unaccompanied by a man. 
He sometimes with great caution approaches houses, and should he see a man, he runs away with astonishing swiftness, leaping the tallest fences with the ease of a deer, to find alike the pursuit of men and dogs. He has frightened several women by attempting to carry them off, as well as by his horrid aspect. And the whole country around Sabi is in consternation. Citizens are now scouring the woods and are determined either to capture or drive off the monster. Cryptid? Pervy, hairy creep? Both? Now imagine that some bitch riding the Rocky Branch giant rape beetle as his trusted perv steed. Sounds like a hairier version of last week's subject, Paul Bernardo. Maybe his fucking creepy dad, Ken. Who the hell was this wild man? Some believed him to be a former member of a local town. <laughs> Who had either gone insane or was fleeing some kind of conflict involving humanity. Okay, all right. <laughs> but how does that explain his hound-beaten speed? Maybe they only used uh, old fat dogs to try and run him down. I don't know. Same year, 1871, a wild man supposedly rounded up by a squad of citizens near Morgantown, West Virginia, 327 miles from Piney, Tennessee. Fucker probably jogged down to West Virginia one day. Described as half man and half beast, covered in rags with long, brushy hair, giving him the appearance of a gorilla or that a human being. This wild man said his name was Thomas Foley, a native of Ireland, of course. Probably Scots Irish. Fucking hillbilly. Living in the woods. Foley said he lived in Connecticut for some years before fleeing for the wilds of West Virginia. <laughs> where he'd been living off the land. No structure for two years. That's what he said. So uh, when someone from the search party brought him home, dressed him in nice clothes, it said that he escaped, bolted for the mountains, tearing his clothes off as he ran. So maybe a cryptid or maybe just a super weird dude. <laughs> Likely very mentally ill. 1880, uh, 1877, party of gold miners traveling through the Globe Valley in Caldwell County, North Carolina, encountered another wild man. Although they only got within 40 yards of this man, uh, one miner claimed that this peculiar specimen of humanity appeared to be a giant, six foot five inches with a funnel shaped head and two inch long dark hair covering his body. Okay, now we're talking. That thing, maybe not a hillbilly, although some are known to get hairy and not have the most uh, traditional, traditionally shaped heads. Uh, hmm. uh, when this fellow spotted the miners, he pounded on his chest before turning, bounding off into the woods with the speed of a deer. The party tracked him with guns drawn uh, to a cave deep in the mountains where they supposedly found bones of many animals scattered about, indicating that he'd been living, feeding there for a while. I'd like to believe that this wild man was that fucking Thomas Foley character from West Virginia. Been out in the woods for eight goddamn years now, getting bigger, hairier somehow. More Tennessee wild man uh, sightings would follow two decades later. In 1896, Forest and Stream, an outdoor magazine, kind of a precursor to Field and Stream, uh, published a sketch of the wild man of uh, Chilhowie, a creature with talon-like fingernails and toenails, tusks instead of teeth, and hair and beard to his waist. And I think maybe this is still Thomas Foley, 187 miles, 19 years from that Highlander's last sighting. Of course, he has talons on his fingers and toes. He hasn't clipped anything in 27 years. He has tusks for teeth because he's been fucking eating rocks. He's adapted to eat rock when he gets hungry. So much calcium in his system. Uh, four hunters encountered this naked wild man in the forest of East Tennessee. After following him back to his lair, they attempted to seize him and take him to Cleveland. But the man used his brute strength to overpower the man and, rent and run. And then a posse returned for this wild man, did capture him, supposedly sent him to an insane asylum. According to the report, he now reposes in comfort. God dang it. They locked old Tommy up. It seemed like he was doing so well. Clearly not a cryptid here. Uh, just another mentally ill mountain man. Two more crypt cryptid adjacent sightings and then back to a real monster, the Stanley Gaster. More Brown Mountain Light stories come in 1897. Joseph Lovin, who lived next to Lovin's hotel, said he uh, had first noticed the lights in 1897 and uh, took no interest in them. Didn't hear anyone else talking about them until his neighbor, C.E. Gregory, began trying to draw public attention to them around 1910. So what were they? Well, they didn't know. Strange lights flickering around, sometimes in the trees, sometimes floating above the trees, where no man no, nor train was known to be. Brown Mountain Lights were featured in an episode of The X-Files. Field Trip. 21st episode of the sixth season. Came out in 1999. Vince Gilligan co-wrote that episode. The creator of Breaking Bad. The cause of the lights in the X-Files series, uh, a mysterious hallucinogen caused by fungal spores. Kind of like magic mushrooms. Maybe alien in nature, though. 
Shrooms can make you see some strange lights. Uh, now for another wild man sighting, a big bastard. February 8th, 1889, the New York Times reported the following. Chattanooga, Tennessee, February 7th. The citizens of Walker County, Georgia, a few miles from this city, are very much excited over the existence of a genuine wild man who haunts the mountain region of the county. He is described as being of gigantic stature, covered with a thick growth of hair, and carries in his hand a huge knotted stick. He looks as if he might be the twin brother of Barnum's wild man and is fierce and untamable. This modern Orson has been seen by several parties. One gentleman, bolder than the rest, encouraged the creature in a lonely part of the mountains one day, not long since, and at a safe distance, endeavored to strike up a conversation. A perfect shower of stones greeted his final words, and thinking discretion the better part of valor, he made tracks from the dangerous neighborhood. So again, maybe just a fucking weird dude. Maybe not a cryptid. This next creature, though. Ho, 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 ho. Definitely cryptid. Uh, February 1909, an article claimed that a man had been seized by the Snallygaster, which proceeded to sink his teeth into his jugular, drain his body of blood before dropping it off along a hillside like a fucking proper monster. Sick, bro. The story was carried prominently in Middletown, uh, Maryland's Valley Register and soon spread far and wide. So much so that the Smithsonian Institution offered a reward for this thing. Not kidding. Even 51-year-old current president, Teddy motherfucking Roosevelt, famous as a big game hunter, reportedly considered postponing an international trip, this is while he's an active president, to personally hunt this beast. Holy shit. I'm well aware that the seeds of war may be being planted in Europe at this very moment, gentlemen. And I will travel to the German Empire shortly to talk to Emperor Wilhelm II. But first, I have a Snallygaster to hunt. And the months that followed, Snallygaster footprints reported in New Jersey. Then in West Virginia, a woman claimed that she uh, almost, was, almost got abducted by this dragon-like beast. A farmer claimed that Snallygaster uh, roosted in his barn, too, laid an egg the size of a barrel. Holy shit. wonder what that egg would taste like if you scrambled it up with a little bit of milk, some butter, a lot of salt and pepper. Probably delicious. I love eggs. I bet I would love a Snallygaster egg. Snallygaster Benedict with some wild man hollandaise sauce. That sounds gross, actually. Also, a man in Castown, Ohio, wrote a letter to the Valley Register telling of a strange creature that flew over his area making terrible screeching noises. Described as having two huge wings, large, horny head, and a tail 20 feet long. God dang. I think more from a fucking siren demon to a dragon over the past century and a half. That's impressive. It's mutating out there in the forest. Uh, another sighting in Frederick County. Occurred in March 1909, where three men claimed to have fought the creature. Hell yeah. Outside a railroad station for nearly an hour. That's a long ass fight. Oh, I'm sorry. Hour and a half. Excuse me. Longer fight. And they chased into the woods of Carroll County. Too bad they couldn't catch it. Not every day you come face to face with a fucking monster dragon demon thing. Afterward, no more sightings of this mysterious creature for the next 23 years. 1910 would mark the first appearance of another Appalachian. Appalachian creature again the whirling wimpus this one ho! Oh, this is quite the fever dream according to lumberjacks who spotted the creature in eastern tennessee the wimpus has a gorilla shaped head and body enormous front feet and tiny legs small but powerfully muscled and it gives this uh, tasmanian devil-like creature the ability to spin very quickly like a top it is the spinning that gives uh, this thing its name the whirling wimpus and that's its primary hunting mechanism as well. A wimpus will allegedly use its strong arms and rapid spinning to beat victims into a paste. It is like a Tasmanian devil. It likes to hide next to a trail, apparently, then pop up, stand on its little hind legs, and then just fucking whirl, whirl, whirl. Any person, <laughs> any person or animal coming up on the trail could get sucked into a fucking vortex this thing makes. And then the pressure of the vortex will turn its prey into syrup and then the whirling wimpus will slurp up the blood syrup. Seriously, that is the legend. I feel like I put more thought into the Rocky Branch giant rape beetle than early wood folk put, in, put into the backstory of the whirling wimpus or just the, the tail. What the fuck is happening here? Lumberjacks would blame the wimpus for the disappearances of inexperienced fellow loggers and hunters. If the lone hunter made the mistake of venturing out into the woods alone in the morning, didn't return before sunset, people assumed in small isolated areas, hey, you know, they were the uh, whirling wimpus, syrup snack. Because the wimpus was so bloodthirsty, there were oftentimes no large and identifiable remains, clothing, or weaponry left behind. Everything got pulled into the vortex. The wimpus would devour every last bit of them. According to these lumberjacks, search parties would come across large footprints left deep in the woods filled with small pools of thick tree sap. Hmm. This was the good evidence that their buddy had been fucking syruped by the wimpus, had been whirled. 
The search party would listen, uh, you know, when they saw this, these syrup tracks for distinctive buzzing sounds that the wimpus would make when it whirls. Can we agree that these lumberjacks uh, who came up with this story were so fucked up when they did? A lot of moonshine went into that legend. And this next creature is even weirder. This might be my favorite. Also 1910. 1910 book, Fearsome Creatures of the Lumberwoods. <laughs> the Lumberwoods. Uh, would describe a creature from Pennsylvania known as the squonk. The squonk is of a very retiring disposition. This is the description here. Generally traveling about at twilight and dusk. Because of its misfitting skin, which is covered with warts and moles, it is always unhappy. Hunters who are good at tracking are able to follow a squonk by its tear-stained trail for the animal weeps constantly. When cornered, an escape seems impossible. Or when surprised and frightened, it may even dissolve itself in tears. So it sounds like it might literally just, you know, just cry itself to death sometimes. It, it, <laughs> it cries because it's so sad and ugly. And sometimes it ugly cries its ugly self to death. That is the weirdest, saddest cryptid I've ever heard of. Uh, later retellings added that squonks were slowest on moonlight, moonlit nights because they would try to avoid seeing their ugly reflection in bodies of water. <laughs> in addition to warts and moles, uh, you know, later on in their mythology, the creatures were given webbed toes, but only on their left feet. That creature sounds like it was made up by a 1910 version of, uh, of me. Uh, now we're in 1913. Another explanation for North Carolina's Brown Mountain Lights is tossed out after another reported sighting. This account of the lights dates from September 24th, 1913, as reported in the Charlotte Daily Observer. Uh, described mysterious lights seen just above the horizon every night, red in color, appearing punctually at 7.30 p.m. and again at 10 p.m attributing the information to Anderson Lovin, an old and reliable resident. Locals asked their congressman for a government investigation, and the U.S. Geological Survey employee D.B. Sterrett, dispatched to the area, quickly finds that the headlights of the westbound Southern Railway's locomotives would have been visible from Lovin's hotel, and the train schedules he consulted left him no doubt. These were the cause of the lights that were being reported. But, 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 as I reported on episode 116 of Scared to Death, in July of 1916, these lights would still be spotted despite local flooding pausing train service to the area for several weeks. So, hmm. Not satisfied by the train light explanation, Brown Mo Mountain was featured in an American pulp magazine, the Argosy, telling people the lights were UFOs. And then many started to believe the mysterious lights were aliens. Uh, lights were reported as being white, red, yellow, orange, and blue. Described looking like large balls of, balls of fire to small candlelights, anything in between. And from floating near the ground to rising up high into the sky, and they are still seen today when the trains are not running. Hmm. All right. Late 1920s now. More Snallagaster sightings. Fuck yeah, bro. Where's that demon dragon siren thing been? Because of the gap in sightings, some now assume that the lifespan of a Snallagaster is around 20 years. And the new Snallagaster is the uh, child of the one from the 1910s. That makes me think, why would they assume only one would exist at a time? Did they reproduce asexually? Does one Snallygaster give birth to a new one, a clone, then die? Uh, once again, Snallygaster back in Frederick County, Maryland. According to locals, the creature now is stealing chickens and other small animals. Farmers uh, are thinking this Snallygaster is a huge pest. Man, sounds like this Snallygaster a bit smaller than his dad mom. Snatching chickens. Hard times for a demon dragon. Something this monster's uh, reappearance showed up because of prohibition. Moonshiners in the area uh, reported to have fanned the fear flames of the Snallygaster in an effort to scare government agents away from their distilleries. Also tried to explain the sounds that came from their stills at night. Accounts of thunderous explosions, loud screeching sounds began circulating with disturbing regularity. As the noises became more common, so did reports of a winged creature. This time it has razor sharp teeth, occasionally alongside huge octopus-like tentacles. It's getting scarier again. And it'll swoop down and snatch grown-ass men, drag them off at night. So is it a little chicken snatcher or is it a big dude grabber? The Baltimore Sun published some articles, as did the Washington Post. Uh, these articles reference in sources, but not given dates, so I don't have them to share. Thinking about what they, uh, you know, may have read like, made me think about like a, like a breaking news broadcast about this thing. Hello, people of Baltimore. Here at CRPD News, we just received a report of another area snallagaster attack. The demon dragon was spotted in the backyard of Agatha Nichols where the 78-year-old witnessed the creature chasing her silky terrier princess before she walked out and yelled at it. It then whimpered and flew off. Mrs. Nichols told a CRPD reporter that it looked tired and hungry. 
It seems that this creature is of the chicken snatcher variety and not the man-grabbing type. So <laughs> keep your pets inside, your chickens cooped, and rest easy, Baltimore. Stay tuned for more news at 11. Uh, the more articles that were published, the more pressure came to catch or photograph the Stalagaster. National Geographic even prepared an expedition to capture this thing on film. Uh, trying to avert a panic, the Baltimore Sun reported the Stalagaster was dead in November 1932. I love that people were apparently starting to panic. <laughs> Are everyone's bags packed? We, we gotta go. Grab the dog. Get, get in the car. Now. We, we gotta get the 9 o'clock train to Boston before that demon dragon returns. Oh, God, it's one of the big ones. On uh, the paper, a shadowy photo of the dead creature accompanying a questionable account of how it had drowned in a vat of whiskey <laughs> on a Baltimore County farm. By suspicious coincidence, the report stated that the federal prohibition officers inadvertently blew up the still before the carcass could be examined. And then when prohibition ended a short time later, stories about the Stalagaster dropped off. 1934 now marks the arrival of another true Appalachian, Appalachian, sorry, cryptid, the devil monkey. Hell yeah. That's a way better name than the whirling wimpus, even though the thing is scary. You know, but if I'm going to an old time wrestling match, I'm going to put some money down on the wimpus or the devil monkey based on name alone. For sure, going to pick that devil monkey. This Saturday night at the Allegheny County Fairground, it's the Whirling Wimpus versus the Devil Monkey. Monster versus monster. Wimp versus chimp. Can a banana-loving Satan monkey withstand the twirls and whirls of a little-legged vortex syrup-loving Sasquatch kind of thing? Who wins? Who spins? Find out on Saturday night at the Allegheny County Fairground. We'll sell you the whole seat, but you'll only need... You get it. Uh, <laughs> the first reported encounter with this reportedly swift, dangerous predator. Occurred in 1934, South Pittsburgh, Tennessee. According to reports, which were allegedly published in national newspapers, eyewitnesses described a mysterious beast that could leap across fields with lightning speeds. The ability to jump great distances up to 20 feet, according to some accounts, have led some to speculate that these animals may have something in common with kangaroos. Or they're not real at all and made up by lunatics. Or that. Related to kangaroos or related to the whirling wimpus. I'm going to be honest. I'm uh, very open to the paranormal. The most I've ever been since I was a kid, but uh, no super strong contenders so far out of the creatures for something real in my mind, right? I'm just uh, not feeling it quite yet. Uh, hey, Dan, uh, David Hancher Childress here, uh, Gil Gris. Uh, applying the paradigm of the known to the unknown uh, just isn't a fair way to evaluate cryptids. Uh, the world of science uh, through experimentation and uh, exploration has redefined uh, what is known many times over, which has led to incredible discoveries, which have cured diseases, uh, sent man to the moon. Uh, to use about two examples, the whirling wimpus, while foreign to your mind, uh, may fit in perfectly with the rules followed by fauna of, say, parallel universe, overlaying our own that science uh, has yet to discover. Uh, so you, so you believe. In the, in the whirling wimpus. <laughs> no, uh, that's nonsense. But, but keep an open mind uh, for the rest, maybe g going forward. Uh, uh, thanks, David. That was actually really good advice. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, I'll just, uh, I'll just show myself out and, you know, until you uh, need me next. Huh. Wow, he didn't, he didn't even plug his uh, new show on A&G. Maybe it's Giants or anything. That was a really nice, you know, children's appearance. Uh, next monster, uh, Dusk, September 12th, 1952. And the first recorded sighting of the Flatwoods Monster occurred in West Virginia. The May brothers, Ed, 13, Freddie, 12, have been playing in their schoolyard when their 10-year-old friend Tommy Heyer shows up. After the boys notice a pulsing red light streak across the sky and crash at a nearby farm, they run to grab the May's boy's mother, then High tailored up to the hill to check out where the light landed. Then a few other boys, one with a dog, shows up. Not sure why the dog detail is important. Doesn't come up again in the story. They ran back down the hill in fucking terror. And then another guy said he saw it. Seven Braxton County residents on Saturday reported seeing a 10-foot Frankenstein-like monster in the hills above Flatwoods, a local newspaper report uh, said afterwards. A National Guard member, 17-year-old Gene Lemon, leading the group when he saw what appeared to be a pair of bright eyes in a tree. Lemon screamed, fell backward. The news account said when he saw a 10-foot monster with a bloody red body and green face that seemed to glow. He may have had claws for hands, hard to tell because of the dense, weird mist surrounding it. Like with Mothman, the sighting uh, blamed on, uh, you know, people seeing a normal creature by a lot of folks. Uh, probably a barn owl. Flatwoods monster, even though spotted first, ended up kind of becoming a low-rent Mothman. 
Locals in Flatwood erected a welcome sign, which our welcome sign, which designated the town as home of the Green Monster. Uh, the town also commemorated the legend uh, in an annual Flatwood Days festival, but uh, no one really fucking cares about it. Flatwoods is only home to about 260 people. Now I'm guessing not even all of them show up to this festival. Uh, the Devil Monkey. That'll show up again in 1959. Boyd family driving through the mountains near their home in Saltville, Virginia. According to their account, an ape-like beast attacks their car, leaving three scratch marks on the vehicle. The Boyd's daughter, Pauline, describes the terrifying attacker. It had light, taffy-colored hair. With a white blaze down its neck and underbelly, it stood on two large, well-muscled back legs, had shorter front legs or arms. A second devil monkey encounter allegedly occurred just days later in the same region. Several days after this incident, two nurses from the Saltville area were driving home from work one morning and were attacked by an unknown creature who ripped the convertible top from their car. That's fucking terrifying. Luckily, the nurses were unharmed. And I have to wonder, is this devil monkey Thomas Foley? Come on, he escaped that mental institution sometime after 1896. He's over 100 years old now, continually mutating, growing stronger and stronger. Hail Nimrod. May we all live as long, but maybe not mutate quite as much as Thomas Foley, Irish wild man. In 1970, another creature appears, the Pennsylvania White Bigfoot, first spotted, or Thomas Foley again, assumed to be a cousin of the normal brown Bigfoot. The Pennsylvania White Bigfoot, first spotted by a woman referred to as Annette B., According to Annette, the creature stood between six and seven feet tall with a broad chest, long neck, coat of dirty white fur. Annette went on to describe its face, saying, its eyes were dark and spaced far apart. Its white hair covered the lower half of its face. There was pinkish skin around the eyes and forehead. It looked like its hair was a little longer on its head and hanging over its forehead like bangs. Bigfoot with bangs, fuck yeah. White fur is like a yeti that wandered way off course from the Himalayas. Maybe fell into a teleportation vortex or something. The next year, real different kind of beast appears. First media mention of Goatman comes on October 27th in the Bowie, Maryland-based Prince George's County News. <laughs> Sounds like a real pathetic superhero. It is Goatman, able to eat much more than a regular man and also be more sure-footed on steep hills and rocky crags and, you know, kick pretty hard. Goatman, no normal man, he's hairier. And uh, goatier. He has a hell of a time finding shoes that fit his little goat feet. <clears throat> in this article, uh, writer Karen Hosser takes a deep dive into the University of Maryland folklore archives and finds Goatman. In an article, sorry, this year, in 71, two weeks later, Hosser writes a newspaper article with the headline, Residents Fear Goatman Lives, Dog Found Decapitated in Old Bowie. The article describes a search of a family, the Edwards, for their missing puppy named Ginger. Oh, no! Gigi! No, Didi. Not my little Didi. Days later, Ginger uh, is found near Fletchertown Road, dead and headless. Fuck. Didi, stay away from Goatman. The article connected the deceased dog with Goatman, saying that a group of teenage girls, including the Edward's 16-year-old daughter, April, heard strange noises, saw a large creature the night the dog disappeared. I also reported that sightings of an animal-like creature that walks on its hind legs were increasing along Fletchertown Road. Luckily, after this dog, it never seems to have killed anything else. Weird-ass goat dude. Just takes one dog then fucking disappears forever back into the ether. A mysterious white creature seen in July 1973 in the TNT area of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, the epicenter of the Mothman sightings during that 66-67 wave we mentioned before the timeline. Uh, This creature would become known as a white thing, not the most creative name, or some people called it a devil dog. Not all creatures called devil dogs, uh, I guess, necessarily appear as dogs. They can be lions. They can be big cats. Uh, One thing stays the same, though. They're stark white with long, shaggy hair. Huh. Uh, I don't know. Not sure that that's true, but that's what some sources say. They move at lightning speed, sometimes on two legs rather than four. Sometimes they seem to have too many legs. Their chilling screams sound like a woman being attacked or murdered. Whatever they are, they're bloodthirsty. They attack without provocation. Their attacks are so real. People actually feel the beast's fangs tearing into their flesh. But when the attack is over, they're shocked to find themselves without any injuries. It was all in their mind, maybe. While they don't physically seem to hurt humans... They maybe rip up animals, tearing out their throats, mutilating their bodies, leave uh, corpses bloodless without a trace of blood around. It's never been directly witnessed, but, you know, assumed. One witness, a 28-year-old man, uh, when interviewed, would say that he saw a devil dog when he was seven. So that seems very legit. If you can't trust a seven-year-old when it comes to accurate information regarding unexplained creature sightings, I mean, who can you trust? Everyone knows that seven-year-olds report fucking facts. Nothing but facts. Uh, The kid was riding in a car with his family. 
1973, when he looked out the window, saw a creature bounding down the road next to him. The creature was white with thick, shaggy hair. He couldn't see its face, but he said its head was about three feet wide. Okay, all right. Seven-year-olds, also very reputable sources when it comes to size explanations. The creature appeared suddenly alongside the car and floated through the air, following them for a few moments at about 65 miles an hour, and then poof, gone. Let's hope this next sighting feels more credible. Uh, September 27th, 1973, two young girls. So, okay, fuck credibility. Standing outside in Beaver County, Pennsylvania, 9.30 p.m. And they said an eight foot tall bean covered in white fur, red glowing eyes, runs into the woods nearby. Could it be the Pennsylvania white Bigfoot or Thomas Foley? They said this humanoid carrying a large glowing orb in its hands. That's interesting. The girls ran off hysterically into their house. The father of the, one of the girls then went into the woods in search of this creature, stayed there for over an hour. That same year, observers noted that two Bigfoot like creatures uh, were seen standing in the same pasture, not far from this. Uh, one woman tried to fire her shotgun at them because when you don't know what something is, you fucking try and kill it. But she missed. They disappeared. Then right after they disappeared, a glowing orb appeared in the nearby woods. What does that mean? I don't know. But I bet that Squirrelander Highlander, there can be only one Highlander. Thomas Foley does. Also in 1973, uh, cryptozoologist, author Lauren Coleman, investigator reports of three black bushy-tailed giant monkeys said to have slaughtered livestock in Albany, Kentucky. There was a fucking epidemic of livestock slaughter uh, because of giant demon monkeys, devil monkeys. Coleman mentioned the event in an interview with Animal Planet, saying, I investigated the case in depth. I interviewed the people who were very sincere. In the whole context of devil monkey reports, it seemed extremely sincere. Yeah, I bet uh, a lot of devil monkey reports are pretty wild. You have these reports of hairy monkey-like creatures with tails, very different than Bigfoot. This guy, 70, uh, 74-year-old from Norfolk, West Virginia, has written over 40 highly respected books or 40, over 40 books like The Field Guide to Lake Monsters, Sea Serpents, and Other Mystery Denizens of the Deep and Cryptozoology A to Z, The Encyclopedia of Lock Monsters, Sasquatch, Chupacabras, and Other Authentic Mysteries of Nature. I'm guessing he and Childress know each other. Yet another new Appalachian, Appalachian cryptid would arrive on the scene in August of 78. The Grass Man, a.k.a. the Ohio Grass Man, a.k.a. Bigfoot, but different name. Maybe not a new cryptid, maybe a repackaged one. The first prominent sighting of the grass man occurred in the small village of Minerva, Ohio. August 1978, the grandchildren of Evelyn and Howe Clayton, along with their friends, ran inside screaming about a hairy monster they all saw in a gravel pit outside. So that is interesting. A lot of people have seen it. When the couple went out to investigate further, you know, uh, they see the creature is covered in dark matted hair. Oh, sorry, the kids ran in first and then everybody else sees it. Uh, I just read my own notes wrong. And they see this thing... Uh, Dark matted hair sitting in the fucking gravel pit and fiddling with discarded trash. And they estimated it was, <laughs> it was around 300 pounds. So maybe a monster or maybe, you know, you know, just a large, hairy, sad dude sitting in a fucking gravel pit, you know, sifting through some trash. Not, what, not knowing what to do, the Claytons fled. But then Grassman would return. One night, Grassman was seen peering at them through their kitchen window. This fucking sad gravel dude wanted a snack. Hal ran for his gun, but then this primate or sad guy was gone before he returned. The area was later investigated by police, although there was no sign of the hairy humanoid. Several faint footprints observed in the mud and a terrible smell still lingered in the air. A smelly, sad guy. Clayton's then saw the Ohio grassman again atop a hill on a nearby strip mine the night a few, a few days later. The next month in broad daylight, the couple observed two hairy bipeds on the same hill. This fucking grassman's got a lady. Only after these reports made by the Claytons uh, were made that a startling connection was made. Days before the gravel pit incident, the Clayton's German shepherd was found dead, his neck broken. The Ohio grass man obviously killed it. it. Took him a while to put that together. So are Bigfoot and grass man the same thing? Well, people have speculated that grass man is another species similar to Bigfoot. Perhaps, you know, a, a, a group uh, of Bigfoot got separated over time from all the other Bigfoots that no one can ever catch. And, uh, you know, they developed their own unique traits. Uh, this seems to happen with Bigfoot more than with any other cryptid. Practically every area has their own hominid variation prowling the woods. Even Ohio, where the grass man is allegedly from, has, you know, there's regular old Bigfoot sightings there too. Uh, according to the Ohio Bigfoot Research Organization, BFRO, Ohio has over 300 Bigfoot sightings. Here's one of them. Happened in 2005. As investigated by BFRO and, uh, investigator Stephen P. An event earlier in the month preceded the sighting at the end of May 2005. At that time, the mother of the witness and her boyfriend had heard something lurking in the woods 
near the house that ran away when they tore up some cardboard to fuel a fire. Their opinion was that the sounds created as it ran were bipedal and indicated significant weight. A few minutes after hearing it run away, the couple heard a loud howling sound. The witness stated he had joked with the boyfriend about howling a howling Bigfoot up until the night he heard the howl and had the sighting a few minutes later. What? Who jokes about a howling Bigfoot? Then sees a howling Bigfoot. I've never even heard of a howling Bigfoot. I don't know. Suspicious. Initially, the witness thought he was observing a telephone pole along the road as he left his mother's home. He described what he saw as being the color of a heavily creosoted pole. He approached it for an estimated 5 to 10 seconds. At a distance of approximately 25 feet, the creature jumped off a four-foot embankment, ran across the road in three or four steps. He further stated that he nearly collided with it as it was as close to 10 feet from the front of his Jeep. It was illuminated by high-beam headlights during the encounter, and he did get a good look at it in profile, and then slightly from the rear. He estimated that five seconds elapsed between when it jumped and when it disappeared into a field on the other side of the road. Its vehicle speed during the encounter approximately 35 to 40 miles per hour. The road is a typical rural road in Ohio, 12 to 14 feet wide in pavement, with gravel shoulders to allow cars to pull off enough to pass each other. J.W. described the creature as being a very dirty, dark brown, almost black color. In profile, it did not have a stout, and the head flowed directly onto the shoulders and chest with no neck evident. He described the hair as coarse and similar to an Airedale's coat. His estimate of the height was 7 feet, and weight in excess of 300 pounds. The head had a conical quality to it, but it was rounded at the very top. He described the posture as that of a big, muscular man with a back problem as it ran over leaning forward. He observed the arms bent and pumping, and could clearly see that it had hands and fingers, although the angle of observation only allowed him to see the top of the hands, which were hair-covered. The witness says that the animal did not look at his jeep during the encounter and did not see facial features or eye shine. Uh, why would this thing look at his jeep? Like, or like, or like why wouldn't it? That's kind of weird to me. Like, what, what kind of creature runs next to the jeep but doesn't look at the fucking jeep? And, ha- and posture of a large, muscular man with back problems. I, well, I actually love that. That does paint a solid picture in my mind. Goes on a little bit more. His initial reaction was one of disbelief as to what he had observed. When he returned home, his wife stated he was visibly agitated. He immediately called his mother and told her to be sure that she locked the doors. He said her boyfriend mentioned that he should check the BRFO sounds page. And he stated that howls there were very similar. He decided to submit his report after listening to those sounds and completed the report during the same visit. Okay, so mom's boyfriend, regular on the Ohio Bigfoot Research Organization website. So that's why he was talking about a howling Bigfoot earlier and, you know, really obviously wanted to see one. Okay, let's see what's happening here. The area of the sighting is near a small city, but is rural in nature with rolling hills, pastures, crop fields, and woodlots. There's a pond and a small creek adjacent to the site of the encounter. This area is located south of a cluster of reports in the BRFO database, database, including the Minerva Monster Incidents. Discussion and arrangements to do an on-site investigation are proceeding with the goal of having access to the property, hopefully in the next two weeks. For a number of reasons, I found this witness credible. Uh, I don't. I find the witness to be a guy who wanted to see Howling Bigfoot so he could have a cool story to share with mom's boyfriend who was interested in Howling fucking Bigfeet's. Big, big footuses. Uh, who is Stephen P? According to BFRO, uh, their website, a chief administrative officer of a unit of local government, a consultant and community faculty member. 1982 now. Moving on to more stories of Brown Mountain Lights. Morganton resident Tommy Hunter said he actually uh, touched the lights at the Highway 181 Overlook. So he looked over the edge, saw a ball of light. It was hovering, touched it. Tommy said it felt like he stuck his, stuck his finger in a light socket. Six other people were with Tommy. Uh, all corroborated his story. As shared on Scared to Death, this experience maybe could be attributed to a phenomenon called ball lightning. But uh, I don't know. No one ever reaches out and touches ball lightning. Stories of the Brown Mountain Lights, they do legitimately weird me out. Uh, Now moving up to the summer of 1987, the Pope Lick Monster. Good name. Stories had existed before this year, but this was the first year the Pope Lick Monster got some media attention. I first read that name as Pole Licker Monster. Okay. Uh, what's that say about me? According to those who report encounters with it, the Pope Lick Monster, a uh, legendary part man, part goat, maybe part sheep creature, reported to live beneath the Norfolk Southern Railroad trestle over Floyd's Fork Creek in the Fisherville area near Louisville, Kentucky. 
has powerful fur-covered goat legs, alabaster skin face, with an aquiline nose. That is a human nose with a prominent bridge, giving it the appearance of being curved or slightly bent, uh, and wide-set eyes. Short, sharp horns protrude from the forehead, nestled in long, greasy hair that matches the color of the fur on its legs. Why do these monsters always have to have greasy hair? Why can't any of them have nice, silky, clean-looking hair? According to some accounts, this creature uses either hypnosis or voice mimicry to lure trespassers to the trestle to meet their death before an oncoming train. That's a very specific way for this fucking goat beast to kill people. Other stories claim the monster jumps down from the trestle onto the roofs of cars passing beneath it. Still, other legends state that it attacks its victims directly with a blood-stained axe. Hmm. Axe variation. Very different than luring people to the trains uh, by tricking them. Also said to, uh, that the very sight of this creature is so unsettling that those who see it while walking across the high trestle bridge will just leap off. So how did this strange creature come to be? Uh, one explanation is that it was simply a human-goat hybrid. That's all. Someone with a weak pullout game fucked a goat, had a goat baby. And then it grew up to be a circus freak who vowed revenge after it was mistreated. So I'm going to say that's probably folklore. Uh, pretty sure I would have covered this thing and the P.T. Barnum suck if it would have actually worked in circuits. circus. Uh, this creature uh, escaped after a train derailed on the Pope Lick trestle. Right? And it's been there ever since. Another version claims that the monster is uh, the twisted reincarnation of a farmer who sacrificed goats in exchange for satanic powers. Okay. So both origin stories, you know, pretty credible. Uh, it would be the Pope Lick train trestle that would become the site of a very real tragedy in the summer of 1987, perhaps because of this folklore. Uh, sadly, possibly, uh, possible, uh, possibly Jesus Christ, in part due to the legend of this monster, the train tracks became a spot where teens and young adults started to do bravery tests to show that they're not scared of the monster. And then numerous kids have died doing this. In the summer of 87, young boy fell to his death from the trestle after evading an oncoming train. Uh, 1988, 17-year-old boy, uh, or man, I guess, young man, kill, uh, hit and killed by a train. Uh, 2000, 19-year-old fell to his death after trying to get away from a train. April 23rd, 2016, 26-year-old tourist from Ohio died after being hit by a train while searching for this monster. Her, uh, her boyfriend survived by hanging onto the side of the trestle. Uh, just over three years later, uh, May 26, 2019, Savannah Bright, 15, pronounced dead at the scene after she and another teenage girl on the tracks near the Pope Lick trestle, possibly looking for this monster. If you go cryptid hunting, be careful out there. Maybe just stay the hell off a trestle that has a fucking daily train service on it. Now let's move to South Carolina. Meet another monster. In the wee, dark hours of the morning, June 19th, 1988, teenage boy named Christopher Davis driving home from work when he blows a tire along the edge of Scape or Swamp near Bishopville. Gets out of the car to change the tire when he hears a sound like someone running, getting louder and louder. Suddenly, from the darkness, it emerges. Blazing red eyes, green scaly skin, long black claws on three fingers, staggering seven feet tall. Thomas fucking Foley, still alive, still mutating, getting stronger. No. Uh, the boy jumped into his car for safety. Then the creature attacked the car, ripping off the mirror, gouging the roof of the vehicle before being able to speed away. Just two weeks later, another odd vehicle attacked. Uh, police, or odd vehicle attack. Police were called to the scene of some vandalism. Car not far from the swamp had been attacked in the night. Fenders ripped off, antenna bent, deep scratches along the body. Chrome trim chewed off seemingly. Over the course of the summer, several more cars in the vicinity of Scape, uh, yeah, Scape, Scape or Swamp, allegedly brutally attacked and chewed on. More people reported seeing an enormous scaly green man lurking in the woods and swamps. Police are called out. Sheriff made plaster cast the enormous three-toed footprints left behind in the thick swamp mud. Thought about calling the FBI, but then thought, now nah, they'll probably just fucking laugh at us. Then as the cooler days and nights of fall approached, no more attacks. Locals thought uh, maybe uh, the ceasing of attacks had something to do with the creature's scaly skin and cold-blooded nature because they thought it was a lizard man. And sightings have continued of the lizard man ever since. Say sources on websites that are sketchy as fuck. And there's been a smattering of automobile maulings, always within the vicinity of swamps near Bishopville. Okay, let's move on now to a probably definitely real cryptid, right? This one's just, it, it sounds real. Sheep Squatch. If you want to be taken seriously in the world of the paranormal, you'd have to talk nonstop about Sheep Squatches. One night in the early 90s, a car full of women making their way home after a family reunion near the uh, TNT area near Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Snow on the ground, they... Crunching along the treacherous roads, uh, you know, just a few miles an hour. And that's when it steps out of the woods. Motherfucking Sheep Squatch. Witness is described as being seven to eight feet tall, covered in shaggy white hair with the legs like a man. They described the face as looking like a sheep face, having horns like a ram. 
Sheep Squatch froze when it spotted the car, then bolted into the woods. Taking a cue from the mysterious beast, the women also hightailed it out of there as fast as their wintry conditions would allow them. So what is Sheep Squatch? Let's hear its epic origin story. Sheep Squatch was once Nathan Campbell, ordinary taxidermist working in Point Pleasant. While stuffing a sheep late one night, lightning hit his shop at the exact moment he was bitten by a Roanoke recluse. And the electrical charge combined with the spider's venom, combined with a little bit of showbiz, mutated Nathan's DNA, blending it with the sheep's, turning him into something new. Still mostly a man, but sheepier. Not as smart. Able to live outside longer. A lot more wool. Hornier. Strong hankering for grass and weeds. Prone to follow anyone around him with any basic leadership charisma. Nathan Campbell died that night. And Sheep Man was born! Or Sheep Squatch uh, has no known backstory. Uh, Bummer. Bummer. Uh, January 12th, 2016. Devil Monkey. Fucking back, bitches. He's left Appalachia. An anonymous witness claimed that he and his family entered the Chicago home to discover that he uh, asserted, uh, discover what he asserted was a devil-like creature violently attacking his six-year-old Labrador dog. The man further described this beast as being an unusual combination of monkey, wolf, and devil. Long fangs, monkey-like tail, extremely bright glowing eyes. The man claimed that he remained calm enough to grab a nearby camera and snap a photo of the allegedly diabolical fiend. Apparently he didn't fucking care about his dog getting attacked. After the flash bulbs burst, this creature purportedly sprang to its hind legs and ran, nearly pushing over this lucky fellow and his family in an effort to escape through the open door behind them. So where is the photo? Um, well, <laughs> funny you should ask. He has it. it. He definitely has it. He's waiting for the right, uh, t- it's still at the lab. And he, he's going to, listen, he's going to have it. He's going to get it soon. Let's move on to the next date. Uh, back to Bigfoot type creatures. 2008 video appeared on YouTube that would quickly become known as the Pennsylvania white Bigfoot clip that I can't fucking find anywhere. So I'm guessing it's not awesome evidence. But in July, 2008, a local news station in Pennsylvania runs a story which talked about the white, possibly albino creature after receiving an anonymous email. It was said to be some sort of animal about six to seven feet tall, covered in all white fur. The email specifically mentioned a wooded area in Carbondale near a mine reclamation site. In 2010, more people began to report sightings of a white juvenile Bigfoot in Carbondale area. Not just, a, not just not an adult Bigfoot, like a teen Bigfoot. Homeowners began to hear strange noises and disturbances in the woods. This thing was probably fucking or beaten off or something. One case, an unidentified man witnessed movement in his backyard, was able to capture some bizarre video footage. For one full second, the man filmed a large white creature that resembled the shape of Bigfoot. In the video, as the man's camera hits the creature's face, it quickly moves away. And while it would be easy to say that it was just someone wearing a Bigfoot costume, commentators have said that the creature's body proportions are extremely large, which is not something faked easily according to them. According to the source we found for the story, the creature also has a defined brow ridge, coned head, hooded nose. The shoulders are extremely high. The arms are long. Most importantly, the video shows the object's face contorting as it runs away, which suggests that it may not be a mask. But then I watched this video that they linked to, and the description does not match it. It is 1,000% for sure a fucking dude in a mask that is not even a good mask. God damn it, guys. Come on. I know you want to see it, but Jesus Christ. Uh, Despite only shitty evidence like this, belief in the Pennsylvania white Bigfoot continues, with many believing it is simply a Sasquatch that has aged. Just as human hair becomes gray and white as the person gets older, so as it is for the Squatch. Uh, Fresh evidence of the Lizard Man would come out in 2015. It was in the form of a photograph of the creature taken by a woman with her cell phone as she left church. And I've examined this photograph, and it is for sure a dude in a fucking shitty, cheap lizard suit. Get out of here. And I will continue with more recent Appalachian cryptid sighting stories from the past few years, but, or I would continue, uh, sorry, but uh, all the ones we found, they fucking suck from the last couple of years. So let's get out of the timeline and look at a couple more that are at least entertaining. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. Have you heard of the recent cryptid to take over TikTok? Have you heard of the Appalachian Not Deer? Seriously, that's its name. Not Deer. No one really knows what these things are. They're just definitely not deer. At least according to supposed sightings. Many people have had incidents where they've found, uh, you know, that their paths are crossing with a deerish type thing. Maybe walking through the woods, driving home at night. At first, they think, yeah, this is a deer. 
But then on second glance, they're like, I don't know. It looks like a lot like a deer, but not exactly like a deer. Some people say the proportions are off. Others say that there you know, are maybe too many joints or not enough joints in the legs that would normally be in a deer. In a couple of different cases, some form of not deer said, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, the wrong number of fucking hind legs or maybe arms with hands in place of the front legs. On TikTok, as of last night before recording this, uh, the hashtag not deer currently sitting at 73.5 million views. I watched a few of these uh, videos and I wish I could have those few minutes of my life back. People claiming to see not deer, from what I can tell, are people fucking too dumb to understand what goddamn deer looks like. Every single not deer, I looked at, I was like, yeah, that's a fucking, that's a deer. Uh, excuse me, uh, David Hancher Children's here again. Go Grizz. Uh, are you mad at me for just not taking a lot of these sightings seriously, especially the uh, not deer? <laughs> no, uh, not at all, actually. Uh, I wanted to take a, a moment to just tell all the idiots TikToking about not deer to just knock it the hell off. No one is ever going to take our cryptid claims uh, seriously. If, if people are muddying up the water with a bunch of bullshit, pardon my French, not deer talk. You not deer believers are making the world and wimpus people look legit. Uh, so what should the not deer folk do, David? Uh, you know, it's like I always tell uh, cryptid newbies to ever be taken seriously for cryptid proof we must watch. Please don't act too mysteriously. Let's focus on catching a squatch. That, uh, that was nice, David. That was cute. I, li- I like you today. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Hail Nimrod and, uh, you know, go Grizz. All right, another, another pleasant children's experience, actually. Uh, now let me explain what these not deer actually are. Most popular explanation for not deer, you know, obviously, obviously first off is just fucking regular deer that people who don't understand deer don't understand how to identify. But also it's a uh, deer with this, uh, and I've seen deer like this and it is sad, CWD, chronic wasting disease. According to the CDC, deer with chronic wasting disease may exhibit drastic weight loss, you know, wasting, stumbling, listlessness, other neurologic symptoms, uh, decreased interactions with other animals, uh, lowering of the head, blank facial expression, repetitive walking in circles or other set patterns. Uh, excessive salivation, drooling, grinding of the teeth also observed. It is a fucking bummer to see these deer when they get this. According to biologists, outbreaks of the disease tend to occur every few years. Uh, Such conditions could create the perfect opportunity for repeated sightings of bizarre or strange deer over time. Not deer stories, you know, just misidentification of deer. And sometimes, you know, also urban legends told, you know, just for people's amusement, which I get, that's fine. Uh, One more, Spearfinger. That's a fucking great name. This cryptid is more like an entity comes from a Cherokee legend, which makes it appropriate to tell in a little homage to the Cherokee who once called the Appalachian Mountains their home. Uh, According to the legend, Spearfinger, a shape-shifting witch with stone skin, long obsidian spear in place of one of the fingers on her right hand. Stone skin and a spear finger, fuck yeah! Immediately in the running for coolest creature this episode. Definitely cooler than Sheep Squatch, uh, Whirling Wimpets, and not deer. Spearfinger roamed the mountains between what would become North Carolina and Tennessee. And they say even though the Cherokee caught and destroyed her, you can still hear, hear her ghost shrieks and cackles to the mountain night. Spearfinger had a taste for human livers, especially those belonging to Cherokee children. Eek. So parents used the legend of the Spearfinger to warn children to stay close to the village. Yeah, one of, the, one of these tales. In uh, the autumn, the Cherokee tribe would burn brush fires to clear the land so they could find fallen chestnuts for the winter. But Spearfinger would use these fires to locate their village. She would come in the guise of an old woman, fooling Cherokee children into trusting her because she appeared to be a village elder. She would offer to brush their hair until they fell asleep. Then she would stab them with their finger through the back of their neck or heart and then eat their liver, giving her mouth its distinctive red color. It's a scary monster. She had a song that she would sing as she moved to the mountains with her raven friend. Liver, I eat it. Liver, I eat it. That's the words. Uh, I'm guessing that phrase flows better uh, narratively, uh, you know, song-wise, in the original Cherokee. Though she most often appeared as an old lady, she could be anything she wanted. Another child, a friend, an animal, maybe Thomas Foley. And because she was made of stone, no weapon forged by man could stop her. Her only weakness was her heart, which she carried in her hand for protection. Interesting. Her enemy, Stone Man, also ate livers. A lot of fucking liver eating back then. And he wasn't helpful to the Cherokee either. She and Stone Man had powers to move rocks and boulders. And once Spearfinger created a great rock bridge through the air to travel from mountain to mountain, angering higher beings who destroyed it with lightning. The remnants of the bridge remain visible today near her hunting ground of Whiteside in Jackson County, North Carolina, which is far to the south, close to the Georgia border. Known as Thunder Mountain, Whiteside offers some of the highest sheer cliffs in the Appalachian Range. 
Eventually, the Cherokee set a trap for Spearfinger, digging a deep pit, disguising it with leaves and sticks so she'd fall into it. Then they set a fire to attract the mountain, which is attention. Soon, an elderly woman came along the trail, fell into the pit, revealing herself to be the witch. The Cherokee warrior's arrows, however, had no effect on the stone-skinned witch, who taunted them with her liver-eating song, right? Remember that classic ditty? Liver, I, I eat it. Liver, I, I eat it. Uh, I love how detailed and fucking weird this story is. Eventually, a titmouse came and told the hunters to aim for her heart. And then the hunters, not knowing the witch, carried her heart in her hand, aimed for her chest with a little impact. When that didn't work, the hunters caught the titmouse and cut off its fucking tongue. In Cherokee folktales, the titmouse forever associated with lying now. Fucking titmice. You can't trust them. Finally, a chickadee came, landed on Spearfinger's hand, showing the hunters where she held her heart. The hunters severed her heart from her hand, killed the witch, earning the chickadee a better reputation among the Cherokee as a truth teller. Always trust the chickadee, never trust titmice. Got it. This is a very helpful story. Now, according to Cherokee legend, the bird perches near a loved one's home while they're away. You can expect a safe and happy return for the traveler. But the titmouse shows up fucking all bets are off. Cherokee eventually conquered Stone Man as well. Stone Man could not bear the sight of a menstruating woman, apparently. Okay? According to legend, the sight of seven menstruating women would kill him. I get it. I mean, that's a lot of menstruating women to see all at once. The Cherokee arranged, arranged seven women along the trail where Stone Man and the guise of an old man would come. By the second woman, Stone Man was vomiting blood. He really hated menstruating. By the seventh, he'd fallen weak. The medicine man then pinned him to the ground, built a great fire over him. Stone Man called for a bear and deer and all the animals of the mountains, but he eventually succumbed to the burning pile before they could get there to save him. Now, apparently, you can hear his, his cries echoing through the mountains at night as well. So, there you go. That story was a, uh, you know, nice reminder that we've... Uh, We've come a long ways as a species when it comes to storytelling abilities. That was a bunch of fucking crazy gibberish. I mean, it was interesting, but if that was Stephen King's latest story, I would fucking throw it in the trash. And I would accept that he'd finally run out of good tales to tell. Appalachians, cri- Appalachians cryptids, real? Fake? Let's recap all this insanity uh, right now. Uh, Appalachian cryptids, holy moly, there are just so many of them. And if you want to hear about even more, well, watch Mountain Monsters, I guess. They have loads of episodes about creatures with even less evidence of their existence surrounding them than the ones I mentioned. Uh, The Wampus Beast, the Lizard Demon of Wood County, the Yahoo of Nicholas County, Hellhound of Pike County, Grafton Monster, Werewolf of Webster County. Apparently every county has a monster. The Death Cat, Hogzilla, so many different Squatches, the Black Wolf, Woman of the Woods, the Little Girl. Seriously, that's a recent episode. One entity just called Little Girl. They're running out. They're running out of cryptids to talk about, I think. Next season, I think the entire season should be dedicated to the immortal wild man of Thomas Foley. There are a lot of these supposed creatures. Some say uh, some say there's too many of these supposed creatures in Appalachia. Like if there's so many species running around, you know, uh, why wouldn't we have any evidence by now? Some photographs people could actually share with the world. Some actual cases where they've been, uh, you know, trapped, not just fake trapped, like on mountain monsters. I don't know. Are they real? Uh, probably not. At least 99% probably not. A couple stories though, they could be real. I mean, why not? That's exciting. And the ones that are fake, well, they make for some good free entertainment, don't they? They make the world more interesting. Their stories make Appalachia more interesting. And it's already a very interesting place. The history of Appalachia's cryptids started back before European arrival with Cherokee, other Native American folk legends. When German immigrants arrived in the area in the 1730s, they named some mysterious entities they thought they saw the Schnellergeists, quick spirits. Those spirits would eventually become known as the Hooch Drowned Snallygaster. There were those mysterious apparitions at Chimney Rock in 1806, which locals interpreted as, you know, seeing a play-by-play of the American Revolution taking place in the clouds with fucking tiny horses. So weird. Then the 1850s saw the belled buzzard, a buzzard with a bell on its neck that was a very successful prank. Next, there were reports of wild men in Appalachia throughout the second half of the 19th century that were probably just mentally ill guys living out in the woods or Thomas Foley sightings or maybe some genuine Squatch sightings thrown in there. But I doubt it. Where are the bodies? The legend of the Snallygaster surged during Prohibition and faded when it was over. Real cryptid or way to keep people away from uh, moonshine stills. The whirling wimpus showed up in the early 20th century as a way to explain loggers disappearing in the woods. And if anyone proved that thing is real, I'll fucking cut my own dick off on video. The squonk. Not sure why the squonk showed up. So sad. So sad. Come on, cheer up, little buddy. In the 1950s, the first sighting of the Flatwoods monster occurred. And then sightings of devil monkeys, all kinds of Sasquatch you could ever imagine. The goat man, the devil dog came next. The sheep squatch, lizard man, grass man. The Pope Lick monster. So many more. By, ni- by 2017, people in South Carolina weren't about lizard men. 
And lizard people are not real. There are no space lizards controlling anything. Definitely not this show. Uh uh-uh. uh. Mm. <laughs> Gosh dang. Time now for today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one Appalachia is full of supposed cryptids. From all sorts of varieties of Bigfoot to the Sheep Squatch to the Sally Gaster to the Whirling Wimpus and more. No end to what people have reported seeing in the mountains and valleys of Appalachia. Number two, Appalachia is a diverse and fascinating region. Looking at you, Popcorn and Jim Tom. Combining elements of Scotch-Irish, German, Scandinavian, and African culture, but mostly Scotch-Irish hillbilly culture, uh, with Appalachia's relative isolation from the rest of the country, has led to a unique culture that can be seen in everything from its folklore to music to cooking and, of course, cryptids. Number three, the banjo. While its popularity does come from Appalachia, the actual original instrument comes from Africa. Number four, Appalachia. That is the primary and most correct pronunciation. Appalachia, mostly for Northern Appalachians and outsiders like me. Number five, new info in August of 2017, a wandering shaman mistaken for yet another cryptid, yet another variety of Appalachian Bigfoot, North Carolina. This Bigfoot uh, sighting happened on Friday, August 4th in the Appalachian Mountains. And while not a cryptid sighting, story worth sharing because how weird it is, uh, Gowan McGregor said he was participating in a sacrament of wearing of hair-covered animal skins and wandering in the forest, Mm -hmm. as one does, when a group of hikers came across him and thought they'd run into Bigfoot. And McGregor believes in Bigfoot just as much as the hikers he came across. Of course he does. Uh, The 36-year-old McGregor, who was on vacation from Minnesota, writes on his blog about his personal belief in Bigfoot, or the divine nature of Sasquatch, as he phrases it. He writes, that by, he writes that by dressing in sewn animal skins and by reciting a Sasquatch prayer, he is not insane at all, he has had several encounters with the beast. After seeing the sighting report on the news, he felt obliged as an honest citizen to come forward and tell the world this Bigfoot uh, sighting was not real. This is, just a, this is just an ordinary wandering Bigfoot shaman. <laughs> just, just a little bit of a pelt sacrament. McGregor, of course, his name is Scottish, says, if someone caused you to have an experience that meant something to you but wasn't genuine, wouldn't you want them to tell you? Right? He's, a, he's a weird guy, but he's, a, he's got integrity. Before he came forward, but after his sighting, police in neighboring South Carolina were advising citizens not to shoot any big feet or Bigfoots. No one can agree on how to say the plural version. Since you'll most likely be, found, uh, be wounding a fun-loving and well-intentioned person sweating in a gorilla costume. Noise. Solid advice. Let's get out of here. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Appalachian cryptids has been sucked. Fuck yeah! Oh, buddy! Hope you enjoyed learning more about just a push of mountain monsters. I did. Uh, thanks for listening to the show. All of you who do, uh, week after week, spreading the suck. Family, strangers, friends, coworkers, total strangers as well. Uh, appreciate it. Appreciate you keeping this all going. Thanks to Bad Magic, uh, the productions team, for helping and uh, making time suck every week. Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins. Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley. Sophie the Fact Sorceress Evans. Fucking killing it again with the research this week. Uh, thanks to Bit Elixir for keeping the Time Suck app running smooth. Logan, the art warlock, Keith, our creative director, creating all the merch at badmagicmerch.com. Running the social with Lizzie and Chantress Hernandez, who also runs our Cult of the Curious Facebook 2 private Facebook page, along with her wonderful all-seeing eyes moderators. Thank you, Liz. Uh, thanks to Beefsteak and the Mod Squad for keeping Meat Sacks happy on Discord. Next week, something inspirational, as is our Time Suck tradition for the last suck of the year. Uh, been a truly trying year for many, harder than 2020. A lot of small businesses folded, for example. A lot of people experiencing extra financial hardships due to extended lockdowns, supply chain problems caused by both COVID, varying governmental reactions to COVID, a lot more cultural tension than we've experienced in many years in the U.S., a lot of division out there. So let's jump into the story of someone who lived through a much more trying time, much more divisive time, overcame a lot more than just, uh, just about almost anyone today. Someone whose life story is A, interesting as hell, and B, inspiring. Well, and I'll share more personal information about what we've been doing here at the end of the episode, a little year-end review. So the topic is Robert Smalls. In the midst of the Civil War, Robert Smalls, a black uh, slave, a dude, commandeered a Confederate ship, delivered 16 black men, women, and children, passengers from slavery to freedom, to Congress. Robert Smalls, uh, and, he, and then he made it to Congress. Uh, Robert Smalls, uh, born into slavery in Beaufort, South Carolina, Beaufort, sorry, April 5th, 1839, grew up enslaved. After the Civil War broke out, he was assigned to the Planter, a Confederate military cargo transport ship. Small, Smalls piloted the Planter around Charleston Harbor, gained the confidence and trust of the three white officers. Knowing the crew trusted him, 
that his black crew members, Smalls devised a plan of escape. One night when the officers left to sleep ashore, Smalls and the crew took the ship. Smalls piloted the ship out of the harbor, surrendered the planter and his cargo to the Union Navy, and then volunteered his knowledge of Charleston's defenses, leading to the capture of Coles Island a week after his escape. Rear Admiral Samuel Francis DuPont wrote that Robert is superior to any we've come across in our lines, intelligent as many of them have been. The people of the North celebrated Smalls and his crew. Congress awarded them half the value of the planter as prize money. Smalls traveled to Washington to meet with President Lincoln, where he helped persuade Lincoln to permit black men to serve for the Union Army. Soon after the meeting, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton ordered 5,000 former slaves to fight for the Union. Afterward, Smalls became the pilot of a Union ship, the USS Crusader, later captain of the planter, became the first black man to be promoted to captain. 1897, by an act of Congress, granted a pension equal to that of a Navy captain. Uh, even though there was some, yeah, commission stuff we'll get into later. Uh, after the war, Smalls returned to his native Beaufort, uh, bought his former master's home, fuck yeah, seized earlier by Union tax authorities. In 1868, Smalls elected to the South Carolina House of Representatives, later to the South Carolina Senate. 1874, elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. As a member of Congress, he fought against the disenfranchisement of black voters across the South. Represented South Carolina's 5th Congressional District from 1875 to 1879, and again from 1882 to 1883. Served as uh, South Carolina's 7th uh, and 7th Served in South Carolina's 7th Congressional District again. 1884 to 1887 in the 1890s was offered a U.S. Army Colonel's Commission in the Spanish-American War and the post of U.S. Minister to Liberia, but turned down both offers. And then in 1915, he would die at the age of 75 from diabetes. Smalls died as the South worked to recreate a new form of slavery through the Black Codes and Jim Crow laws. Despite this, Smalls refused to engage in pessimism, telling the South Carolina legislature, my race needs no special defense for the past history of them in this country proves them to be the equal of any people anywhere. All they need is an equal chance in the battle of life. So let's hear about his struggles, his victories next week. A lot more to his life I look forward to sharing with you. Uh, right now, time for this week's Time Sucker Updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker Updates. I'm uh, going to kick things off this week with a fucking crazy Ken and Barbie Killers update from Ontario Super Sucker Haley Moore. Who writes, hello, suck master. Greetings from Canada. Eh? I just finished, uh, just finished listening to the Ken and Barbie Killers episode, and I wanted to reach out and tell you my little slice of the Paul and Carla saga. Saga, excuse me. When I was about eight or nine years old, my mom and I lived alone in a city not too far from Scarborough, Ontario. Uh, one night, while my mother sat in our living room watching TV in the dark, she heard a man cough from outside. When she turned her head toward the full-length floor to ceiling window, she saw a man standing outside looking in with his dick in his hand. Holy shit. Immediately, she stood up, screamed at the pervert, told him she was calling the cops. The guy obviously took off running. My mom followed through on her promise, called the police to file a report. My mom happens to be a very talented artist. So when the cops came to the house, she offered to make a sketch of the guy. They took the drawing, thanked her for the info, and left. And we never heard much more from them. Now jump ahead a couple years, and there's a rapist on the loose who's been dubbed the Scarborough Rapist. A victim of this disgusting creep also provided a description to the police who created the sketch, and wouldn't you know it, it was the same face my mom saw looking in at her from outside our house that night years earlier. That is terrifying. As we know, the Scarborough Rapist turned out to be Paul Bernardo. So we had a too close encounter with one of Canada's most reviled and heinous murderers. My uncle, who worked for Canada's CIA, known as CSIS, ended up using my mom's sketch of Bernardo as a teaching tool for many years afterwards, helping to train future investigators on the importance of eyewitness accounts and facial recognition tools. Thank goodness we were only casually involved in this piece of shit's crime spree. As an aside, Carla Homolka ended up living with a relative at a senior's residence in my hometown after she was freed from jail. Holy cow. And we would occasionally see her around. They should have both been locked away for the rest of their lives, allowed to rot. How she was allowed her freedom is beyond me. I hope they both die painful and prolonged deaths. Anywho, thanks for taking the time to read this story. Thanks for the hours and hours of enthralling entertainment. I don't know how I'd get to my Mondays without it. Keep on sucking. Cheers, Haley. Thank you, Haley. That's fucking crazy that your mom had that encounter. I mean, how terrifying and also how lucky she was to see him before it was too late. And I wonder if that was like during his peeping phase when he was building up to rape, but maybe hadn't quite committed rapes yet, at least not of strangers, as we talked about in that episode. God, what a fucking piece of shit. Uh, next up, a crazy Menendez suck related message from another sucker who had a brush of sorts with the killer. Johnny Serrato writes, Greetings, almighty leader, master sucker. 
It's the OG Satanic Hispanic, faithful sucker and longtime listeners. Listen to the episode of the Menendez Brothers and loved it as usual. I heard the part where you mentioned it was very rare for a child to kill both his parents. I agree with you, but figured it was finally time to write in and share my story with you. The date was June 2011 in a small town in Florida called Port Port St. Lucie. I was a junior in high school at the time. Buddy of mine got invited to a party, asked if I wanted to tag along, and I agreed. The person throwing the party was a kid named Tyler Hadley who went to my high school. There was about 50 kids at the party, and uh, when we arrived drinking, smoking, there was a kid uh, uh, or two on the living room desktop computer playing music. Uh, Remember that detail. Everyone was having a good time, but what everyone didn't know was that hours before, Tyler had brutally murdered both his mom and dad with a fucking hammer. Crazy shit, right? According to the trail, uh, according to the trial, excuse me, Tyler stood behind his mom while she was sitting at the computer. Yes, the same computer partygoers were playing music on with a hammer in his hand for 10 minutes or so, contemplating killing her. Finally, he started beating her with a hammer. When Tyler was asked in court why his mom stopped fighting back, he said, because she loved me. Oh my God. Tyler's dad ran out of the bedroom to see what the commotion was and stood in shock to see his once beloved son, what he had done to his uh, mother. Tyler then went after his dad, killed him as well with a hammer, dragged their bodies in the master bedroom, piled a bunch of shit on top of them, cleaned up the bloody mess for three hours, then proceeded to post on Facebook his parents were out of town and he was throwing a party. I remember actually sitting on the couch when Tyler, with Tyler, asking him hypothetically what his parents would do if they came home and saw a party was going on. He calmly replied, they went out of town with a neighbor and, uh, you know, flew, which is why uh, both their vehicles are still in the driveway. Tyler ended up telling his best friend, Mike, what he did. He then left the party early. Mike did, called the police to inform them Tyler had killed his parents. He now sits in prison in the Okeechobee, Florida, uh, or in Okeechobee, Florida, where he'll spend the rest of his sorry life, hopefully forever. Some very freaky shit. A day I'll remember for the rest of my life. Hope you like my story. Thought you'd find it interesting. Thanks for all you do and for making my work days a bit more bearable. If you happen to read this, uh, if you could give a shout out to my sexy goddess of a wife, Caitlin Hale Lucifina, and my fucking crazy, but I love him uh, to death, son, Little Johnny. Well, shout out to Little Johnny and Caitlin. And uh, wow, man, I looked up uh, this, this story, Johnny. And yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy that you and Joe Paisley both knew people who fucking killed their parents in high school. Because it is so rare. Wow. Uh, Now a painful and poignant message from a wonderful sucker and another victim of the opioid epidemic, Eric Sippel. This kick-ass sack writes, Hello, master of all that is suck, writing in about the opioid epidemic episode. I've listened a couple times now since this subject hits home for me. Back in June, my father passed away from an OD of prescription opioids. I really loved your presentation of everything. The most depressing part is that my kids, 13, 5, and 3, will not be able to grow up with their grandfather. My dad had a history of abuse and addiction problems, which he told me uh, he was clean of a week before he died. And he wasn't wrong. A man with a history of addiction was prescribed strong opioids for a bad back he had from years of construction. And unfortunately, his demons came back. I don't blame him or even his doctors. It's just a tragic outcome and a casualty of this epidemic. If you do happen to read this on the air, I just want to say to anyone listening that has or knows someone with an addiction problem, get help. It's not a sign of weakness. Nobody will think less of you. If anything, it takes a strong individual to admit they need help and then go get it. You always have more people in your corner than you realize. I would have done anything to help my dad with his problems, but sadly, he tried to tackle it himself. Thank you again, Dan. Keep doing what you're doing and spreading the suck. Well, uh, thank you, Eric. And man, yeah, sorry for your your tragic loss. And I appreciate you sending in that message because it's going to be more powerful coming from you with what you've experienced than it would be coming from me. So I appreciate it. Uh, and a lot of other people will as well. Finally, a little cool little message I found inspiring that also just uh, made me happy. Reinvigorated sucker, Abigail Lynn writes, I just wanted to pass on how wonderfully educational and enjoyable the show has been over the years. I've been with Time Sucks since the Caligula episode where the Jimmies, uh, yeah, from Small Town Murder and Crime and Sports where the guest stars, guest stars. They were my first podcast. This was my second. Love all the bad magic shows. The content here really makes my ear holes happy. I write because reigniting my love for learning really inspired me to go back to college. For the third time since enrollment, I have now used an episode of Time Suck as an academic reference, and I wanted you to know that your content is considered not only reliable, but enjoyable by the professors that I have shared it with. That is fucking awesome. I love that you're able to use this stuff as a source. I love that we do post the uh, show notes with all the, uh, you know, sources uh, on the Time Suck app where you can download the PDF. And yeah, use it for school. I mean, you know, take the fucking hours and hours of research we do here and have it help cut down some hours on your end. Why not? And I love that this has reinvigorated your thirst for knowledge and made you go back to school. I hope you kick so much ass, Abigail Lynn. 
Great name, by the way. And just uh, you and everyone else, keep on sucking. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks again for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast, Meet Sex. Uh, happy holidays. Right? Remember remember that? What we listened to earlier? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. How does that not put you in a holiday mood? If you see a squonk this week, please tell her how cute it is. Give that sad, ugly little fucker a hug before it cries itself to death and keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. Bang don't dang don't dang dang bang dip a dang dip a dang dip a dang dang dip a 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 dang